the crisis of the Same thing, just by slide. It's the same thing? Yeah. All right, then we cool beans. Okay. Good, um, good morning, everyone. This is a joint committee between the Safety Committee and the Committee on Public Health. And Madam Clerk, do we have a quorum? Yes, Mr. Chair. Mrs. Uh, Madam Chair, would you call, Madam Clerk, would you call the roll? Lenzig. Present. Jones. Gray. Here. House. Mooney. Here. Slide. Present. Starr. Conwell. Here. Here. Harsh. Here. Moore. Thank you, thank you, um, Madam Clerk. And um, before I call upon uh, the safety director and the chief for um, comments, I'm going to call upon uh, my colleague, Councilman Conwell, if he has any comments prior to the reading of the legislation. No, I don't have any comments at this moment. You know, I'll, but you know, I will throughout the uh, committee. So we'll move forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councilman. Um, at this time, I'm going to read the legislation. And again, before I do that, if there's anyone in attendance from the public has been the um, protocol within the safety committee, anyone who would like to comment would see Kimberly uh, behind the plexiglass. We need your name. We need your address, contact information, and um, at which time um, when it is provided, uh, you will have an opportunity to address the members of the body, uh, the committee. Okay. Ordinance number 894-2022 by council members Griffin and Mayor Bibb, Mayor Bibb, excuse me, authorizing the director of public safety or an appropriate director to employ one or more professional consultants to develop and implement a strategic plan to expand the crisis intervention team co-responder program, authorizing the director of public safety or public works to enter into various written standard purchase and requirement contracts needed for a period of three years with, with two one-year options to renew exercisable by the director of public safety or appropriate director and to enter into contract with the various entities to implement this ordinance. It has been uh, first time submitted to council is September 12th, 2022, approved by Director of Finance, and there's no legal objection by the law department. Um, it is amended as well. So I'm going to read the amendments, and um, please listen because they're extensive. There is no legal objection to this legislation if amended as follows. Number one, in the title, beginning in line two, strike authorizing the director of public safety, or appropriate director, to employ one or more professional consultants to implement, to, to develop and implement a strategic plan to expand the crisis 
and insert directing a portion of the city's coronavirus local fiscal recovery fund payment to the city's COVID-19 response by authorizing the director of public safety or appropriate director to enter into one or more professional service contracts to develop a strategic plan to expand the crisis. Number two, in the first whereas clause, line two, strike team CIT and insert co-responder program. In line four, strike and also include a salary for three years for senior level strategist and insert a senior level strategist and approximately 10 licensed social workers, social workers or other similar professionals. And in the second whereas line two, strike the division of police and insert such expansion. And in the third whereas clause, strike line three, after now insert available. Number three, in section one, strike lines five and six in their entirety and insert necessary to develop a strategic plan for the project and employ by contract or contracts one or more placement agencies for the purpose of supplementing the regular employed staff of several departments of the city of Cleveland in order to provide professional services necessary to supply professional needs needed for the project. In the second paragraph, line one, after consultants insert or agency or agencies. And in line three, after consultants insert or agencies as appropriate. Um, number four, in section two, line four, before ARPA eligible insert R, and in line eight, between response and the end parentheses, insert a quotation mark. Number five, in section five, line one, after the insert, director of. Number six, insert new section 11 to read as follows. Section 11, that the director of public safety shall provide all members of council a quarterly report concerning the effectiveness of the project by ward if available and renumer, excuse me, renumber existing section 11 and 12 to new section 12 and section 13. It was um, signed, dated 10 10 22, signed Stephanie Melnick, um, Chief Assistant Director of Law. Wow, okay. We can figure that one out, all these amendments. Okay. Um, Director, Chief, Director Mr. of Public Safety. Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, yeah. Um, with this amendment, I know we're talking about it. Um, at what point will we be able to make an amendment to this? Because I know I sent something out back at the end of September. Um, and we'll, so we'll make an amendment after we hear the presentation All right. from the administration and after lines of questioning. Uh, directors, um, the floor is yours. Tell us about um, this legislation. Chair, thank you. Before I, um, uh, before I read the legislation, I'd like the um, parties at the table to introduce themselves. Just for the record, I'm Kerry Howard, Chief Director of the Department of Public Safety. Good morning. My name is Carol Ballard. I'm the Director of Education and Training with the Adams Board. Good morning, Chief Wayne Drummond. Good morning, Director Dave Margolius, Public Health. Okay. And um, for the council, we have uh, Director of Community Relations, Angela Shu Woodson, here okay. as well. Um, ordinance number 894-2022, if approved by council would authorize me, the Director of Public Safety, or other appropriate directors to employ one or more professional consultants to develop and implement a strategic plan to expand the crisis intervention team co-responder program. This ordinance would also authorize the Director of Public Safety or Public Works to enter into additional contracts as needed to implement this ordinance as amended by the attached amendment. This legislation will fund a public safety mental health strategist licensed social workers, social workers or other similar professionals, mental health dispatch personnel, 
and equipment for the crisis intervention team, including a vehicle, bullet resistant vest or ballistic vest, uniforms, laptops, office supplies, travel and training, and the development of a strategic plan. The approximate total cost of these items is $5,056,295 over a period of five years and will be funded through the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, Fund 01-001, Fund 15-190, and any other funds approved by the Director of Finance. There's been a lot of talk about <clears throat> the need for crisis intervention, debates about whether or not police should be involved in the value of having the co-responder program and the value, potential value, in having a care response program that does not involve law enforcement officers. Significant conversation has gone on within the administration as well. We know that the co-responder program, the program where crisis intervention trained officers and social workers arrive on scene, we know it has value. We'll hear some of the stats and, and data related to that today. And we also know that there is value in having a response by mental health professionals who are equipped to deal with crisis intervention without police response. How those situations are determined is on, is on a case by case basis. When calls come in to 911 and officers respond, they may not be aware that it is a crisis intervention issue no matter what questions our call takers and dispatchers ask until these officers arrive on scene. All of our officers go through crisis intervention training. We have a few of our officers um, certified as crisis in, in crisis intervention and we have social workers uh, who go out as well. This legislation will seek to expand uh, that co-responder program and also assist with, ex with, with the development of a care response program from the Department of Community Relations. The details of that has to be worked out. There are other jurisdictions that, um, that, that have a care response program. Uh, Chicago is one. In these jurisdictions, um, citizens don't call 911. They call 988. It doesn't come through police dispatch. Um, and then those, those calls are vetted for a care response. Uh, when those mental health professionals, those service professionals arrive on scene, if there is a need for police, they will call the police to come out to assist. The safety is of the utmost importance. And we don't want to send anyone into in any situation uh, where they may suffer um, risk of serious physical harm and or death. Now, we've had incidents um, where police have not uh, arrived on scene with EMS and fire, for example. That inc uh, an incident this year resulted in a woman pointing a gun and pulling the trigger um, at EMS and fire personnel, but the gun wasn't loaded, um, thank God. Uh, but that's a situation where you don't know what you're walking into. We don't know what we're walking into. Public safety, this administration, Department of Health, Community Relations, Youth Violence Prevention, um, all have a very deep and sincere interest, a deep and sincere interest in servicing people who are suffering mental health crisis. We have to give them the care that they, that, that they need. So the city of Cleveland having, a, having dual programs uh, I think enriches uh, our opportunity to, to, to service these citizens with a care, responder, care response program through community relations and a co-responder program out of public safety. And then the, uh, the, the legislation talked about a mental health strategist. Because mental health is a behavioral health uh, issue, this person should be within the Department of Health. So, this, so if, if, you, if you look at all that is involved, this is really an all hands on deck situation with some of the um, most experienced and, and, and the brightest uh, working to tackle this issue. We have a presentation 
Okay. Uh, and I think that it's important so that members of council and the public uh, receive this presentation so they can understand, so we understood where we are now. Um, and here are some of the stats and data related to the program we have now. Um, it'll shed some light on how we uh, would, would intend to uh, look to grow. So, th uh, Director, this will tell us exactly what is taking place right now at, at this moment this, in time. This will paint a picture okay. of, of where we are okay. now. Okay, fine. Proceed. Yes, put it, put it together, right? Yes. So, uh, just th we did a presentation in February this year on crisis intervention. Some of these slides will be very familiar. Right. Same slide deck, but we updated it um, okay. so that it's, it's current. Okay, thank you. Proceed. Thank you, and to the chair, I'd like to introduce my staff uh, as well as here. Uh, in the, to my right in the rear and to your left. Uh, we, uh, the importance of our uh, CIT program, um, it, even before the uh, the consent decree and some of the requirements there uh, to make sure that we have individuals assigned there. Um, we have a captain now assigned there, which is going to be Captain Heather Mish. She's back there. Heather, can you please stand? You have uh, Sergeant Maggie Crespo. Um, they're both per permanently assigned. They're getting up to speed um, relative to their responsibilities in it. Um, you had John Mullen, who was a sergeant at the time, now promoted to lieutenant, who was there in, the, in their stead until they can get seated. He's going to walk them through and, and train them up to where they need to be. Um, so I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Also, at the end, there's is, uh, uh, Acting Deputy Chief Sammy Morris, uh, who the uh, crisis intervention team and co-responders report to. Just want to introduce them as well. So again, it's important to understand the seriousness of this and the uh, uh, commitment we have and the resources we have to this particular program. Uh, additionally, the director is right. He talked about the, the collaboration between community relations, the health department, and so forth, because this is all hands on, on, hands on deck approach. Um, to providing the best possible service to our citizens that are potentially in crises. And this uh, presentation will uh, give you an idea of what the program is doing so far. And the reason we're, we're showing this that, uh, to, to, again, to give you an idea what the program is about and what uh, we've accomplished so far, and to expand that to have uh, additional uh, officers as well as uh, licensed clinicians and so forth, um, to expand the program and, again, have the capacity to provide even more services to those in crises. So I'll go, I'll start right away. So thank you. <coughs> And I just introduced them, you know, it's a CIT program. <clears throat> the coordinator's uh, uh, Brian, captain. Excuse me, Brian, you want to just slide over a little bit? Thank you. Thank you. Is, uh, uh, again, the coordinator's going to be uh, Captain Mish and with uh, Maggie Crespo as the intervention sergeant. And uh, we've been involved with the Adams Board uh, with uh, such a tremendous partnership with their expertise and with mental illness and so forth and the training. We've been involved with uh, them since 2004. As a matter of fact, they've trained uh, over 600 and, and probably just under 700 of our officers uh, since uh, 2004 in crisis intervention. Um, a good percentage of those officers have either retired, left the division, and so forth. Um, but we still have uh, uh, many officers still trained. And uh, we're also training officers through the Adams Board um, and, and their, their help and their expertise, training uh, specialized CIT officers and so forth. So we have uh, uh, several officers, I believe up to 70 or 90, and I'll get the numbers as we progress through the presentation. And again, I'm not going to read every single point in the bullet point, but you can see for yourself, uh, again, we've been uh, uh, doing this for, for since uh, 2004. And there's a goal, and the goal of the CIT program is to encourage and enhance responses to mental health crisis with the behavioral health system. And obviously that's the, through the Adams Board and other uh, partners, Murtis Taylor and so forth, again, to provide the best possible training to our officers so we can help those in crisis. And there's the numbers I was talking about since 2004, 648 members. Uh, since 2020, 107 members of Division of Police have been certified, and this is important. Although all officers receive training in CIT, we have 100, and, since 2020, 107 of our officers actually have, they're certified as special CIT uh, officers. 
Um, and that, uh, of that number, 91 are, are still with the, the, the division so far. Uh, December of this year, we're going to have additional 20 officers that's going to go to the training. And like I stated before, currently, um, our police academy recruits receive 24 hours of instructions on crisis intervention. And I've mentioned our partners, uh, the Adams Board, and they're their role. They're, the, the Adams Board is the behavioral health founder in Cuyahoga County. Um, they help facilitate our training, again, since 2004. And uh, they're um, also, as you can see there, they serves as a co-founder for the Cleveland Co-Responder Team. Um, it's because of them that we're in the position that we are right now with the licensed clinicians, as well as our specialized CIT officers who are assigned with, to the teams. And then the, the goal of the cold responders team, <clears throat> the, goal is to hope, the goal is hopeful that funding will be appropriated to add CIT officers and licensed counselors. And also, uh, I think was a key is a mental health dispatcher. And, and that's important uh, because, um, as the director stated before, in, in different programs and different uh, agencies and different cities and so forth, they have their, their models and so forth. And, and some of these folks are not calling 911, they're calling 988. But if they do call uh, 911, our hope and our goal through funding is to be able to have trained dispatchers, mental health dispatchers, to, to get those particular calls, to triage those particular calls, and hopefully not have officers responding to uh, get them to the appropriate agency to get individuals the help that they need. Um, oh, oh, yes. Chief, on the, on the um, what you're presenting here, the numbers, are these off of last year or what, what do those numbers represent? So um, these, these numbers represent 2021. Okay, 2021. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Ballard. As a number, as stated there, the co-responder teams received you know, just under 3,400 uh, CIT referrals for uh, 20, pretty much 2,700 individuals. And as you see there again, the numbers speak for themselves. They made contact with uh, 1,387 individuals. And of the numbers that I just mentioned, just under 900 accepted referrals. And of course, we can't force anyone uh, to get treatment. Uh, so these folks were referred and accepted it. And again, part of our goals you know, is, is to um, increase public safety and reduce recidivism among high-risk people with mental illness. And the numbers, again, you have 404, 15% of the individuals had multiple co-responders calls for service. That means our officers are responding to multiple um, uh, calls for the same individuals. Uh, as you can see there, 2,976 or 88% referrals resulted in conveyance to emergency departments. Um, for incident, incidents where co-responders were on scene, at the time of the crisis, only 53% were conveyed to the emergency rooms. So that's why it's so important that we have co-responders and officers trained in uh, CIT that can get uh, individuals the help that they need, that they necessarily don't have to flood our emergency departments, that they'll go other places where they get wraparound services and, and help. And again, these numbers are 2021. 2021. Thank you. Yes, and as we progress, uh, uh, Chair, you'll see that we'll, we'll differentiate between 20, okay. 21, and, and so forth. Okay. Uh, 32 individuals were arrested by uh, responding CIT officers. Um, we would like to get those numbers lower. Um, our goal is and our hope is that uh, we don't have to arrest folks that are in crises, but sometimes our, our hands are tied, and depending on the uh, type of uh, incident that's, that occurred, uh, we have to make uh, arrest. Um, and zero use of deadly force incidents by CIT officers. Okay, Thank you. keep going. And where are we now? And here in 2021, officers respond to approximately just under 5,000 crisis intervention incidents. That's a quite a bit, just under 5,000. And uh, these numbers are really important. 98% of the incidents are resolved without an arrest, 98%. Uh, 97 percent, 97 percent of the incidents had no use of force. Again, huge. And when we're talking about dealing with people in crises, uh, that we don't have to use uh, force. That's part of the CIT training, part of de-escalation training and so forth to give people a voice even when they're in crises. We have to give them the opportunity to talk, give them space, give them time. And that's the results of it is that we're using less force. 97% uh, of the incidents resulted in no injuries to persons in crises. And again, very critical numbers and important numbers. 
And that means when we're, when we're dealing with people in crisis, and sometimes, as we're aware at this table or anywhere else, sometimes when folks are in crisis, they can be pretty violent. And uh, for us to, to be able to deal with those individuals, provide the services, and, and hopefully no one uh, gets injured, including the officers and, or, or civilians that's, that's also assisting the officers. And 85% of individuals uh, were handled without the use of handcuffs. Again, very important numbers that we're not handcuffing people who are suffering mental uh, crises at that particular time. Again, especially when they don't know what they're doing and uh, folks are calling us to provide help. So we're not handcuffing folks. We're not using force against folks. We're providing services. For all CIT incidents citywide, individuals are conveyed to emergency room approximately 90% of the time. We're trying to get those numbers down as best we can. Um, uh, CIT incidents where co-responders on site at the time of the incident, live calls, uh, that number drops 53%. We had the, that in there before, and it's important to understand that. That's why it's so important that we expand the program. We expand the program. Uh, we have more officers who are trained. We have co-responders there who's a licensed uh, clinicians, they're there, they're able to, again, diffuse the situation, de-escalate the situation, and then we're, we get the individuals to the places that they should go versus the, the EDs. Um, again, live calls with co-responders, 26% of the time individuals are not conveyed anywhere and their crisis is resolved. Again, important. We like those numbers to go up. You know, 26%, almost 30% of the time, they're not conveyed anywhere. The crisis, again, resolved by the co-responder team or the CIT trained officers. Uh, and again, the live calls, co-responders, 13% of individuals were diverted away from e emergency rooms and brought to crisis stabil stabilization units or the diversion center. So we're trying to emphasize that with our officers uh, to, t uh, to give faith folks or get them to diversion center here for the county as well as some stabilization uh, units as well. Just a question before you proceed with the next page. The, so are conveyed to an emergency room. So they go, that specifically, are all the hospitals, we accept these individuals or we have to take them to certain places? I'll let you um, All of the hospitals accept these patients. Um, and what we have found is that probably 50% of them probably won't get admitted. Um, they're okay. symptomatic, but they're at baseline. And so they usually will give that person a referral. They'll coordinate a referral. They'll try to contact the okay. last known agency and so forth. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Proceed. Chair, could I ask oh, yeah. on that point as well? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I, one thing I'm trying to figure out, um, what is the percentage of the time that the co-responders are on site of the 4,988 CIT-related incidences? How, long, how often are the co-responders on site? Through the chair. To, to the chair, Councilman. The question is how long they are, are they on site? Uh, not how long, but how often. Often, okay. Sorry. Do we, did someone that's answer? Something that, yes, that's something that we're working to improve upon. Um, right now, I would say 10 to 15% of the time they might be involved in a live call by having um, coverage first and second shift as well as working more with those districts so that they can call that team out um, because once they've cleared the scene, the, te the co-responder team can be there to help in the decision making. And most of the time, a lot of those decisions and things that could be done can be done right there on the site, you know, with family members, friends, neighbors, and so forth. Thank you. So just to clarify, you're saying 10 to 15 percent of the time the co-responder is showing up with the CIT trained officer yes, at the front they, end they, of the call. Those officers will call them. You know, because each district has a co-responder team, so they'll call CR2, CR21, or whomever, and say that we're at 77th and so forth, can you get here? If they don't have a call that they're already working on, then they can probably go. Okay, great, thank you. I'll let the presentation proceed. Thank you. Thank you. No, we have here alternative to jail and hospital emergency room. The goal is to keep people with mental illness out of jail and in treatment and on the road to recovery, obviously. Uh, we have uh, some stats here for the Strickland, Strickland Crisis Stabilization Unit, um, Voluntary Treatment uh, Center, which includes you know, free food, room, and board. You have 24 individuals conveyed in uh, 2021, 22 conveyed in 2022 as of 10 
2023. So again, we want to try to improve, uh, improve on those numbers to have individuals uh, diverted to these particular centers versus uh, going to the emergency rooms. Uh, we have the Cuyahoga County uh, Diversion Center, uh, which is a treatment center, alternative to jail for low-level nonviolent offenders. That's the key here, low-level nonviolent offenders. And so far, um, in 2021, 15 individuals were conveyed and 51 individuals conveyed this year, again, as of uh, October 23rd. Now we have uh, final dispositions. Uh, again, we have live calls there and then the follow-up calls. And these are related to, and correct me if I'm wrong, Carol, these are related to our CIT co-responders? Yes, okay. these are related to our co-responders. Um, what we have in here, it shows the, um, the live calls when, they, uh, when the co-responders are there. And then they do a follow-up. Um, they try to make sure that if they have met with this particular person that they got to their appointment. Because a lot of times that's when people fall through the crack. Mm -hmm. That one intervention doesn't always work, so you have to have multiple doses of it. Because you just want to make sure. And one of the things that we've learned is that that continuity really makes a difference. Because it's coming from another system that's saying, I'm just checking on you to make sure that you got to your appointment. It also helps strengthen the case management system because they have a third party called co-responders saying, Mrs. Smith is due for her appointment today. So it, it, it's a nice safety net. Okay. Keep going. And again, this is uh, where um, individuals are, are um, where people were conveyed, again, co-responders. Um, you have the hospital. Um, you have, obviously, 75% of the time, in large numbers, 2,566. Uh, we have, obviously, uh, the numbers for the uh, Children's Hospital, Stabilization Unit, Divergence Center, and, uh, the medical, uh, VA, and other. And then um, clients not conveyed, those numbers are, as you can see, 313, which is 9.2%. And then we have some missing data, which we're, we'll try to reconcile. And this is uh, uh, something that we obviously, uh, uh, we're talking about repeat uh, uh, utilizers um, of the co-responder services. Um, we have, uh, you see to the left there, co-responders utilization frequency 18. Um, and they have number of clients, which is one. So we had uh, only one person. As you go down the list, I think the, 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 the key to this is the repeat utilizations, which is two or more, make up about 14 point, almost 15% of all individuals, but 31% of all co-responder calls. So the goal, again, is to provide people with, uh, who are in crisis with treatment uh, and this wraparound treatment and follow-up to make sure that they're not high users and that uh, we have re repeat uh, utilizations and having our co-responders deal with them. But we will um, until they get the help that they need. Is it working? Uh, since 2020, uh, attempts to de-escalate when addressing individuals in crisis have incre immeasurably increased. Again, very important numbers. Uh, reported instances of listening and interacting with, in conversation decreased over 200 percent. And that's, that's 200 percent. That's part of de-escalation and so forth. Having the officers respond, having the officers take their time, giving folks time and distance to listen to them at 205 percent, uh, I think is uh, great numbers. And a request for a specialized crisis intervention team increased by over 300 percent. Our officers know that they're out there, um, so they're calling them. Um, they're reaching out to them and so forth. And the reason why this is so important that we pass it, we'll, again, we'll have the ability to increase our capacity and, and have more members out there that can respond to those particular incidents and help our officers who are on scene. And again, all of our officers, all of our frontline officers, not just all of our frontline officers, all of our officers have the basic CIT training. The officers assigned to the uh, co-responders program have specialized CIT training. And uh, all officers, when dealing with crisis situations, are required to fill out a form. We call it a Brazos CIT form. And those are the stats right there. Uh, in 2020, uh, just under uh, 4,000 forms were filled out. Um, um, in 2021, just under 5,000. And of uh, October of 23rd, we just have uh, just under 4,100 forms were filled out by um, officers. Um. Councilman Starr, you had a uh, point on the, the, um, the numbers. 
Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Continue. So now we're talking about the ARPA dollars and how it's going to be spent. Uh, the current prog program is set up of one co-responder team, which includes one officer and one licensed clinician. And that's uh, the teams currently work 12 p.m. to 1 p.m., as you see up there. Um, funding will um, provide coverage for a total of 10 to 12 teams to work both day and night, afternoon shifts, uh, with the, when we get, receive the majority of the inter uh, crisis intervention calls. That's important that we cover those particular times, again, because the vast majority of the times are, uh, so the calls are coming in at is those that times. 12 a.m.? I mean, what? 12 p.m. to 10 p.m.? 12 p.m. Noon to 10 p.m. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I probably said that wrong and I apologize. Really? You know what? Um, let me ask yeah. a question. Yes. Yeah. When mentioning the opera dollars, mentioning the opera dollars, so when you guys evaluate this to the Adams, just to the Adams board, um, and I forgot your name. Carol. Carol. To Carol, when we, we evaluate this, because you're evaluating it, we could um, get more funding uh, due to the evaluation process. You think so, perhaps through the state or through the federal government, if we evaluate it? So our partnership is with Case Western Reserve, and um, they do all of our data analysis and evaluation, and they put together all of our statistics for this, mm -hmm. and they are here in the audience today, so they're going to be with us um, as part of this. Anya? That's our statistician oh, okay. back there. Okay, good, good, good. Yes, because I do think um, that it's important to evaluate um, what we're doing and how we're doing it, and it also helps to look at what the CIT program looks like. And as you can see, the progression and even documentation mm -hmm. is uh, continuing to increase. When we first started the CIT program with the City of Cleveland, documentation was very, very low. We used to get all of the stat sheets you know, by paper, and we used to tabulate and put them into our system. When Brazos came aboard, we got a 50% increase almost immediately. Okay, that's good. That's and good. it is, and by the trend of what I'm looking at, so mm -hmm. you were at 4,100 and this is October, you're going to go well over 5,000 if not more. That still may not represent every interaction, but in the state of Ohio, you have to be very proud to know that you have the most comprehensive CIT data in the state of Ohio. Other departments have been looking at what you're doing. They're looking at this. They have been looking at these reports because they can't get the officers to complete it. You have an electronic means which really meets the needs of those officers. I represent CIT International, where we look at data of CIT programs across the country. And this is a shining star that stands out here in Ohio, where others have asked me about how did they get the officers to do that. And you created something very, very unique that created the footprint for what we're doing today. Okay. Chief, continue. You're on the third bullet point down. Yeah, uh, again, if approved, uh, the dollars would help uh, to, for us to get a, a mental health dispatcher. And, and I think it's important because it sounds, when we're, when we're talking about this, it sounds like it's just one individual. I think the key to this is training all of our dispatchers because uh, we have dispatchers, we have call takers and so forth, and sometimes they're interchangeable. So it's important that this training is for all of our dispatchers um, to get them to the level so when there is a call that comes in and it's dealing with someone in crises, They'll have the training and the ability and the skill set to hopefully triage the call. Uh, that's what the training is about. And then refer these individuals, to hopefully refer them to the, uh, the help that they need versus necess uh, necessarily sending um, uniform officers to those uh, particular situations. So that's the key to hopefully uh, successfully uh, getting uh, the, our dispatchers trained. And then uh, also key as well, as, as we are, we're here at this table and around the room, that uh, downtown there's a, a relatively large uh, homeless population. So to, to be able to make sure that we have one or two teams assigned specifically for the downtown area to deal with the needs of the homeless population, and especially those in crisis, it's very important. Keep going. And that's it. Uh, uh, we're ready for any questions. Well, you've got and the last one. How will our funds expand and improve these services? Here. That's what I just did. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, funding uh, would help, uh, obviously, to help mental health strategists, which is, we hope, uh, will be housed in uh, Department of Health. Um, having someone uh, in that particular department uh, to crunch the numbers uh, will help uh, in the services we're going to be delivering uh, to those individuals in crises. And having, obviously, additional li licensed uh, social workers uh, is extremely important because although our officers will have the uh, uh, specialized CIT training, there's nothing to, sub to can substitute having someone to actually, that's what they they went to school for, four years or beyond, and they're licensed. Uh, um, social workers to be able to talk to people in need. So I think that's also very crucial. Um, obviously, again, we have, we're, we're talking about produce cost savings. So when you look at the stats there, the diversion center, use of the diversion center in uh, Detroit, uh, uh, an inmate with mental illness in jail costs approximately $31,000 per year. And compared to uh, someone that's in the diversion center, it drops down to $10,000. So there's a huge savings, at least $20,000, $21,000 there. And of course, and I think this is really important as well, increase our co-responders' handling of live calls in all five districts, which means that when a call comes into 911, those particular uh, co-responder units will respond to those live calls, whereas right now, the officers respond. Um, if it's uh, someone in crises, they then call, reach out for our co-responders unit. This will give us the, the capacity, hopefully, to have them respond to some of the live calls. Um, also, um, this also requires officers to coordinate a response with the team, as 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 uh, indicated, um, as Carol stated before. You know, the officers um, that's responding initially, and that's our CIT trained officers, not necessarily specialized CIT T officers, but our officers responding, dealing with someone in crisis, and then collaborating uh, with the uh, co-responders. Uh, um, co-responders team to find the best possible uh, treatment or referral for individuals are huge. And it's from the stats before, um, the officers that respond initially, they take it very seriously. And that's why they're reaching out to specialized uh, 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 CIT officers, co-responders, because they know they have a situation that they're best suited to handle. And uh, coupled with um, knowing that these individuals necessarily don't need to be in jail. And so that's why they reach out to the co-responders to have them come and provide an uh, alternative to, to jail and hopefully treatment for these individuals. And obviously new protocols have been institu uh, institutionalized. Um, police and training are reassessed and upgraded each year. We do that, again, with our partnership with the Adams Board and so forth, best practices throughout the United States, and implement those, uh, uh, those, those new practices here in the Division of Police. Uh, of course, the division uh, must continue to review best practices to ensure we are providing exemplary services to the citizens of Cleveland. Okay. And that's what we hope to do uh, with this program. Okay. So uh, in the protocol I have here, I have the council president, I have Councilman Conwell, Councilman Starr. Anyone else who is, has questions? Okay. It's life. Before I call upon the council president, um, the five million fifty-six, the the five fifty five million fifty-six thousand, um, those are ARPA funds, and that is um, is that over the three-year period? That's over a period of five years. Five years, okay. Um, I'm assuming the administration has thought or is thinking of how to to sustain the program. So I'm I'm not going to go into great detail at, at this point on that. But at, at some point, I'm hoping to hear from um, because I've always been of the opinion sitting at this table, whatever decisions that we make, um, we cannot create a burden for future councils and future administrations. We've got to, there's got to be a, a process in place. So we implement a program and all of a sudden it, it ceases to exist, okay? So that's one question I have. Y y yes, Councilman. Just to point out, I was um, asking over to the Adams Board that uh, if they evaluate it, one thing about an evaluation, you could sell it. The evaluation of Case Western Reserve, I know they'll do a good job because they're in Ward 9, um, 
But you could take the evaluation process, you could take it to the state as well as to the federal government, and you can get other funding Correct. for it. Mm -hmm. And I yield you. Okay. Yes. Um, Ms. When, Ballard, oh, third of chair. I'm sorry. Hey, that's all right. Um, when the co-responder proposal was presented to the Adams Board, um, the funding from BJA was only enough for three teams. Um, and the Adams Board added its own funding to it in order to expand it to five because we felt that it would make a difference um, in the community. And, there, and you are correct. There are always federal grants and state grants, especially now, federal, that are looking at co-response models as well as care response models. Okay. And so what we often emphasize to our providers is start to look at sustainability from the point that you get that grant. How are you going to live five years from now? Okay. What are the other avenues? And so um, uh, that's something that we are constantly looking at because we know that we will not fund anything for life, but there are probably other opportunities. So this is a good opportunity for us now. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if you have a good evaluation process, um, funders will purchase, they will buy yes. a good evaluation process. So if we do this right, and in the end we hit our goals and objectives, with our evaluation, then we can, uh, other cities, whatever the case may be, will purchase a good evaluation process. Thank you, Thank you Councilman. Sure. A couple other questions that I have. I'm trying to understand the um, mechanics here. Um, a call comes in to police radio. The dispatcher, unless the caller says, this is my my son, my daughter, they've got mental issues. Um, the dispatcher doesn't know. When that call is dispatched, the zone car doesn't know either. So I'm trying to understand um, the, the teams that you're going to have in place. Obviously, they're going to be certified social workers, correct? To the chair, that's correct. We have a, uh, a that's specialized CIT officer, which is a sworn officer and a licensed clinician or social worker. Yes, sir. And are they going to be physically working out of each district, or is there going to be a central dispatch point? It, it always will be a central dispatch point, but they'll work out of uh, the, the five neighborhood districts. That's so correct. So they'll be physically staffed there? To the chair, that's correct. Okay. Um, are they going to receive any, any police training? To the chair, the councilman, you're referring to the licensed clinicians? Yes. Um, they go through training at, through our academy, that's correct. Okay. So we, uh, we are not going to create a situation where now the officers have to worry about their safety besides their own situation. To the chair, councilman, I think it's, it's prudent that, um, first of all, they're going to have training and so forth. They're obviously going to be trained to the level of a sworn police officer. Um, but I think the officers, are, of course, are always concerned about the safety of everyone, including right. the, the licensed clinicians and so forth. Um, through the training, the licensed clinicians or social workers will not do anything that's going to uh, jeopardize their safety or the safety of the officers. And they also know through their training, the licensed clinicians and social workers, to actually take a, a back seat uh, let the officers take the lead uh, where okay. they need to take the lead which is okay. things dealing with law enforcement criminality and any, in a, any other municipalities where similar type programs have been implemented do do, do they receive any like an Ohio OPADA training to the chair to the councilman I can't ask that question I'm not quite sure okay um, will they be will, will they be wearing uh, ballistic vests to the chair councilman that's correct all of them to the chair of the councilman, yes. Okay. Um, working out of the districts, wearing ballistic vests, interacting with the zone car personnel, physically, physically located at each of the five police districts. To the chair, to the chair, that's correct. Okay. Um, at this time, I'm going to call upon, in the order of mm -hmm. protocol, I'm going to call upon the council president. This uh, councilman, I have councilman. Uh, Council President and Councilman Conwell, Chair of um, Health, uh, Councilman Starr, Councilwoman Mauer, Councilman Slight, anyone else? Councilman. Mr. 
President. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of questions. Uh, how does this help us become compliant with the, uh, through the chair, how does this help us become compliant with the consent decree? To the chair, that's a really good question. And uh, again, it's important. Uh, I know that the consent decree is here, and, uh, but I think it's important that the things we're doing uh, uh, is something we would be doing regardless of the consent decree. So I, I, I want to make sure we put that out there. However, the consent decree is here and help us um, um, accelerate um, what we're doing uh, because of some of the requirements. Uh, part of that is to have a, a, a coordinator, which is a captain, um, also have a sergeant that's there, that's part of the requirements and so forth, so we have that, those in place. Um, the, the data collection, uh, which is uh, tremendous, what we're doing now, we're uh, improving on that by having our officers fill out the Brazos form. Um, you can see just from the numbers um, that we are uh, in compliance. Uh, we have over 300 uh, line items in the consent decree. And I can tell you that um, the line items related to the, the, the crisis intervention are pretty much in compliance because we have the, the, docu we have the documentations, we have the stats to prove that we've improved tremendously over the last several years. Uh, the consent decree started in 20, 20, 2015, and here we are in 2022, and you can see just from the numbers that was just shown on those slides. Our, the number speaks for themselves relative to our, our de-escalation, um, referral, uh, referring folks to treatment versus uh, arresting people and so forth. So I think we're pretty much in compliance. We have a ways to go for certain things, but uh, the numbers that we have, the documentations that we have uh, uh, to chair, to Councilman Griffin, shows that we are in compliance um, uh, with the consent decree relative to crisis intervention. Thank you. Um, are all of these, um, are there any issues with this? And I want to make sure I ask this the right way because I know that we don't oversee labor management issues. But I do want to make sure I understand, does any of this conflict with the um, labor agreements that you have with your different um, labor unions? To the Chair of Councilman, none whatsoever. We have sworn officers uh, who are in the co-responders unit, and obviously we have licensed uh, clinicians, uh, which has nothing to do with the the, uh, the bargaining units or the labor agreements. So we are in compliance with the labor agreements uh, and what we're doing so far. We've had no issues uh, since we started or implemented the program. Um, nothing's come to my attention. And uh, again, I believe we're in compliance with the labor agreements. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, to uh, the um, chief as well as safety director, um, give me an example of how this actually reduces the jail population. Does this actually reduce the jail population? Because I know that that's kind of something that we all want to really um, do. How does this um, reduce the jail population? Director. To the chair, okay. Councilman, I, it's, a, it's a great, great question. And I was having a conversation with someone pretty much about uh, this incident and so forth. And, and again, uh, and I say it over again, maybe folks will get tired of me saying it, but I've been on job 33 years. And um, I don't remember having much of a crisis intervention training when I came on uh, many moons ago and even several years into my uh, uh, being a police officer, having type of uh, training and so forth. I can tell you the vast majority of the time when we responded and someone was in crises, um, uh, again, the vast majority don't have hard facts. This is just based on my ex experience um, from being on the job 33 years. A good percentage of those folks went to jail. Um, those are when serious, serious crises we took to uh, Metro, we took to St. Vincent and so forth for them to get treatment. And those, I mean, those are really, really in crisis. You know that they had uh, serious <laughs> mental issues. We would uh, take those individuals to, uh, to get help treatment for the most part. Others who may be borderline, as stated before, they pretty much went to jail. You know, so which means that filled up our, our, our jails with individuals that are in crises. With the training that we have now, our officers understand, again, maybe you don't have the person that's obvious that they have mental issues. I mean, when I say obvious, and again, for an example, one of my first me mental health calls as a, a rookie was an individual who had singed his hair, his hair was on fire and so forth. And I don't want to be gross, but it's just the reality of it. He had feces all over his body and so forth, and, uh, caked all over him and so forth. And, and here as a rookie, um, terrified, I'll be very honest with you, because I didn't have the training, didn't understand and so forth, uh, fighting with this individual. 
finally getting them handcuffed and taking them to get treatment and so forth. You know, so that's very obvious that that person needs treatment. Not often present themselves that way. Others are, are more subtle and so forth. And, and those individuals, I can tell you, went to jail versus getting referral for treatment and so forth. So with our officers being trained in CIT and then especially our specialized CIT officers, they understand that someone's in crisis. Again, maybe not present itself really out there, but, but they know that they're in crisis. So they're referring those individuals to treatment versus taking someone to jail. And especially when we're talking about the diversion center where you have low level offenders, you know, maybe it was a theft, you know, they're involved in a theft and so forth. Our officers respond and so forth. So if you're talking about a low level offense, um, those first folks are diverted to treatment versus going to, in, a, in a facility. So that's how I believe that the, uh, the um, current incarceration level, at least in the city of Cleveland, is going down. Mr. President. Okay. Yes, yeah, just uh, one couple more things. Um, Help me understand because I see different personnel dedicated to this, but can someone give me kind of a clear demarcation of how much public safety personnel is going to be dedicated to this, like body count, FTE, and how much non-safety non personnel will be dedicated to this? Who can answer that? To the chair, I think several people here at the table probably can answer that. Uh, the current program, the current program, we have, um, and I don't know if we have all the numbers there, but when it started, it was five officers, five sworn police officers, specialized training, uh, CIT training, and five licensed clinicians. So that's a total of 10 at that particular time. Five civilians and five sworn police officers. Now, if you include the, the, the coordinator who's the captain, um, and also the sergeant, that puts it up to seven, that's assigned. So we want to increase that capacity. And again, these are specialized uh, CIT officers and the licensed clinicians, and our hope is to increase that. However, it's important to understand, we have currently about 71 officers who are specialized CIT trained, and we have a class that's coming up now where we're gonna have additional officers that's gonna be specialized CIT trained. And though, that, by the way, is a voluntary program. It's voluntary, we don't require every Every single officer in the division of police to be specialized CIT and the reason why is because those individuals have a passion and that's why the program is successful. They have a passion about it and generally they have someone in their family or friend, friends and so forth They may be suffering some type of mental illness so they understand it. Uh, so it's very, uh, very personal to them and that's why I believe the co-responders program that we have here in the city of Cleveland is working. And, and uh, President, through, through, through the right. chair, if I may, is that that the number that you're asking is also going to be impacted by how many um, of the care response right. in community relations. So we'll look and assess, um, that's what the consultant is going to help do, assess how many folks we would need in for the care response through community relations um, and uh, how many folks to be dedicated for the co-responder program with the funds that we have available. President. Okay. Does uh, Dr. Margolis have anything? I mean, what, what uh, personnel is going to be put towards it? Right. So uh, to the chair, to, to the council president, uh, the one senior strategist would live in public health um, if an amendment is proposed to, to propose that. Okay. Um, and uh, that person would coordinate much of these efforts and look for future opportunities for funding, as was referred to. Um, so just a, t a ton of opportunity. I already have really engaged a uh, group of activists who have been uh, offering suggestions and, and different models that we can look at. So, so the honcho that's really going to be calling the shots and making sure that the program is run is going to pretty much be out of health. Yeah, there'll, there'll be, I mean, strategists, so helping to guide the strategy. Not necessarily calling the shots, and, and that's by design. That would be by but design. To, to the chair, on that point, uh, and to the council members, um, it's, a, it's going to be a collaboration. And mm -hmm. that's very, the collaboration with their senior strategists out of health, um, the Adams board, um, uh, our, our citizens are, and activists and so forth. Community and, and community relations, thank you, director of community relations. Um, it's a collaboration of all those, what's best, obviously, for the citizens, and again, the citizens of City of Cleveland, especially those in crisis. Collaborations work well when everybody's on the same page, but collaborations don't always work well when there's different ideals. So right. hopefully at some point in time, there's somebody who ever, if, if you ever need a traffic cop to step in and say, this is it, who's that going to be? 
To the chair, Councilman, that's a very good question. You know, obviously, we all have uh, uh, have uh, someone that, that's in charge of us. I have the, the director, who's uh, who my direct report, and so forth. We also have a coordinator. We have our CIT coordinator. Just that to coordinate is important. That uh, that person, which is the captain Heather Mish, uh, sits down in a room with all the people that we're talking about, from the Adams Board to the senior strategist, who that is. And of course, if this is approved, um, to our our civilian part uh, advocates and so forth, to sit down in one room to make sure we're all on the same page. That's going to be the key to it. I'm not putting it all on our captain, but it's important that we have that collaboration and coordination. And President, I, through the chair, we also have um, Director An uh, Angela Shu Woodson, um, you know, who runs her department. Now, I can tell you that public safety and community relations has been working together very well. Um, and we, um, of course, would speak with the strategists and, and defer to the, uh, to the Department of Health as, as we make decisions. So the, we will, won't be making uninformed decisions. And we'll also be um, conferring with the Adams Board for best practices as well. So we'll it, be making informed decisions. Just, just on that point, Mr. President, to my colleagues, um, as I indicated to the director, I'm going to bring um, at some point soon uh, Director um, Woodson to the table uh, with her team and for the um, for better explanation of how they interact with the Division of Police, because it's of my opinion uh, that we need more folks working in community relations in the street. Um, because I find um, we're seeing more and more neighbor disputes, uh, more conflict, which doesn't necessarily re need a police officer on the scene. Right. But if we can diffuse the situation uh, by having a mediators or our folks out there. Uh, then those calls do not come to Adams, do not come to the police department. And um, so we're going to ask, so you, just so you're aware, as we've spoken and I've talked to uh, Director Woodson, we're going to ask for a full-blown full presentation about the, um, the violence interrupters, the whole thing. And Chair, as, as you're aware, we've had some success in your war. Right by sending community yes. relations folks out there to, to calm situations. And that, that's why I believe it's important yeah. that we need to think other than law enforcement in dealing with some of these neighbor issues. To, Mr. President, I yeah. took to, to the chair, and I'm, I'm sorry, if I, to the chair, to the council members. Um, we work hand in hand with uh, community relations. Um, of course, I, I agree 100% that we should have a, a more robust uh, uh, program in the community relations to handle those mediation issues, and I'm sure we're working on that. But uh, we work in such collaboration, you know, sometimes we have situations that may be brewing in the neighborhood and so forth. We reach out to um, Director Woodson. She sends right. her people out. And on top of that, not only does she send her people out, sometimes her people are aware because they have boots on the ground. They're out in those particular neighborhoods. When we have volatile situations, her people are there. They're, they're boots on the ground, and they're providing information to us to help us calm and it, calm the situation. So again, very good partnership collaboration with uh, uh, Director Woodson and her, her folks and her uh, her, uh, her unit. Thank you, Chief. And Mr. Chair, just to say in closing, I'm kind of biased towards the Community Relations Board and uh, oh, Director Woodson. Uh, to, uh, why is that? Uh, <laughs> so I I, I'm glad that other people are coming around to see the light. Uh, but um, you're right, we don't always need a uniform presence when we're trying to deal with these. And just to let everyone know, I actually had the privilege a long time ago of going to watch the Boston ceasefire. And when we put this kind of methodology in place, where we had a total strategy of dealing with uh, law enforcement, prevention, intervention, and cover the spectrum, uh, we were able to have results to really lower crime rates in the city of Cleveland. So I'm glad that this is manifesting again. In Boston, they actually embedded people in the police department uh, that were social workers that actually were literally based in the different districts, which was a great model. Um, so I'm a big fan of this. And then also, I know that she doesn't know me well, and I don't know her well, but I'm an observer. And Ms. Ballard is one of the top-notch mental health professionals in the city. Uh, so the fact that you have her helping shape this, I think, uh, speaks volumes. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Boy, you were right on time, <laughs> right on time. So again, all. So all members, again, you have 15 minutes for your line of questioning. Councilman Conwell. Thank you very much. Um, on, on topic of um, prevention, that means a lot to me also. Let me ask you this to the, um, to the chair, to the safety director. 
when uh, a car goes to an assignment or to an event and there's a mental illness issue there, we defuse it, but do we document that we had uh, a mental illness issue with this um, um, assignment so that we can um, send it over to try to deal with prevention so if something happened again and again and again, do the chair to the um, safety director. Yeah, if you don't mind, I can touch on it and I'll go to um, the chief. And we even have, I think, Commander Moore, Chief Alisi Morris is still here? Yes. Is still here? So w when, when the officers arrive on scene, um, they'll assess the situation. The situation is captured in their, um, in their reports. Mm -hmm. So in their reports, they'll note um, you know, what they observed on scene, if CIT is called out, um, and what type of services were, are provided. So the officers do document do document that. And um, as you know, um, Councilman through Chair, is that we are also able to look at addresses uh, and locations to see if we've had um, repeated um, visits right. to, to, these, to those folks. And same thing with repeated visits with involving, involving um, uh, people, citizens. Right, Chief, do you want to add? Yeah, I can. Uh, and director's right, uh, and to the uh, chair, to Councilman Conwell. Um, all crisis intervention situations are documented by the officers. Uh, that's where we were able to get our data and so forth. That's where we're able to d discern whether we have multiple or high users and frequent uh, utilizers and so forth. So that's based on the documentation that uh, we have and we're hopeful that the officers when they're uh, responding to calls for service or they run across someone that's in crisis that they continue to document it that's how we're able to come in compliance with the consent decree to be honest with you it's because of documentation and the folks from case and others they have the ability to look at the documentation and provide them to, to see whether or not we are um, doing what we're supposed to do which is de-escalation and so forth you know we're not using force when we shouldn't and that's based again on the documentation which is the Brazos form that's filled out by the officers and we are looking like uh, we're, we're on the, the, the cusp of going over 5,000 uh, forms, which means there are 5,000 incidents um, that we, our officers are responding to. Um, we're over 4,000 now, and it's uh, since uh, uh, 23rd of this month, and those numbers are going to continue to grow up, but ev go up. But every time we have a confirmed uh, CIT, CIT incident, sorry, uh, we fill out the uh, CIT forms. Yeah, yeah that's a lot. Um, to Carol um, Ballard, when you create your pre-testing and post-testing, are you going to put prevention in there um, in, the, in the system? I mean, I don't know. You're the expert. Do the chair. Um, to the uh, to represent uh, to Councilman Conwell. Yes, we can look at at pre and post interventions. Right. Um, with our uh, folks that we intervene with, and we look at progression in terms of how often we see them after the intervention. Mm -hmm. And to look at the co-responder team where they're at 31% of repeat calls or two calls or more, it used to be 50%. So they're actually going down where that person's getting more engaged in their own treatment. And a lot of the beauty of behavioral health is follow-up. So that pre-test and that post-test and looking at behavior is our most important instrument, and we're going to continue to drill down in there. Um, the other thing that I'll add, you were asking about documentation. On the Brazos form, there's a drop down, and it identifies mental illness, substance abuse, veterans, um, mental retardation, developmental disabilities. It identifies several different categories that the officer can check off. I have also seen where officers have written in something that we didn't have. Um, so uh, the form is very flexible for them Good. where they can add something in there that might be missing and they typically can go through that entire form and check it all off. Um, and it makes it easy for them and it takes less than two to maybe five minutes for them to complete. They've done a good job. They can even write in if they, wrote, if they made a referral. They can type that in or there's a drop down box. Yeah, you're going to need to um, do the chair. Um, we have some forms to, to leave with, with um, when we go on, on an assignment that we had a resource guide dealing with mental illness that we could leave it with the um, individuals that the police cars mm -hmm. visited. 
we have a small, um, there's a small, like, card that they can leave for that family member. Got it. And it lists all the crisis numbers. Um, and it's a card that we developed with NAMI and Frontline Services. So the Thank officers you. get that during CIT training. Thank all right, great. And you know, to the chair, um, individual service plans, because it's not just going to, and you know, you, you're the expert. You go to this house, there's a mental case here, and then you go to the next house, there's a mental case, but they're not it's not all one size fit all. You know, you got to have individual service plan for the um, for each different incident. You think, do the chair? Yes. Um, the co-responders will coordinate that plan of care with their um, ongoing agency, um, and that works pretty well because sometimes our agencies have very very large caseloads, mm -hmm. forty five or fifty some odd people per case manager. Mm -hmm. And it helps for them to have some that inreach from the community to help them navigate that community care plan for that person. And so a lot of that tends to happen with our co-responder team. And you, need to, and you know, going to the chair, um, training that um, the safety director narrated, I mean, someone can receive a certification, but I think that when we put the officers out, I think um, having a coach Coaching and counseling need to be ongoing. Training is ongoing because they might see different um, cases. But you had, if we had a coach there, I think that can better help our um, um, process through the chair. Chief. Uh, to the chair, to Councilman uh, Conwell. Uh, we have ongoing training, uh, to your point. Um, our coaches, so to speak, have to use that terminology, so the frontline services and on boards. They, they are our coaches. They're the experts. Uh, they provide the training uh, for our guys and the ongoing training for our guys. So we do have a coach, uh, again, to use that, that term, uh, through the uh, experts, again, with frontline services and also uh, um, uh, Adam's board. Coupled with, obviously, the licensed clinicians and counselors, those individuals have ongoing training to maintain their certificates and so forth, uh, certifications. So it's ongoing training for everyone. And if I may add, may right. add uh, Councilman, to the chair, is that the CIT curriculum is also reviewed by the monitoring team. So the curriculum Great. is, 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 okay. is vetted. Okay. Yeah, you know, you could catch through the chair, you could catch someone doing something right, and you still, when you catch them in that eye, uh, um, aha moment, you still coach and counsel. And um, that's a good thing, that's, that's very, very good. This, uh, the dispatchers that you mentioned, it's gonna be a different number, I think, through the chair, safety director you mentioned, and we have to get that out to the residents well, um, with outreach. We, we don't, how, we don't, how are we, we get out? So that we, we don't have that yet. What I, what, I was, what I was using was an example of a jurisdiction that has a care response model and, and that they use a different number, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, one of the things that, that um, is considered for development is the care response out of community relations, and that would be part of the planning. We would, would come back to council uh, with safety, public safety, community relations, same folks here as well to talk about that as we hash that out. But, mm -hmm. that, but, we, but a care response model and a co-response model will serve the city well, both. Do the chair, have you visit other cities like Detroit or to look at lessons learned different, right? yeah. with other cities to the chair, uh, Ms. Ballard? Um, <clears throat> I've seen um, programs across the country um, both co-responder teams as well as care response teams at, as well as CIT actual programs. Cleveland looks, looks closer uh, like Baltimore mm -hmm. where uh, Baltimore has a co-responder team that's embedded with, uh, with their CIT program and then they have a non-law uh, enforcement team. It's called an alternative response and it's on a separate channel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, it's interesting because it is a milieu, because some calls um, could go directly to that team. In um, our community here, we, we have a number of different strategies. You have that youth team called MRSS, Mental Health Response Stabilization. That's another alternative um, that, could, that has a separate channel or a separate number. So we look closer like Baltimore than we do um, Chicago or Phoenix because of our size of the department and the size of the city and the and just the general makeup 
to me, we look closer to that. You and those are models that I would look at there. Baltimore. Baltimore. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. And if, if, I, if I can add, Councilman through the Chair, I don't want to speak for uh, Director Woodson, but, um, you know, they, the Department of Community Relations, they have their street team along with their youth diversion staff that are licensed social workers who work with safety. Um, and they'll work with us to assess uh, youth and uh, proper placement is done as part of our youth engagement policy as well. So again, that, this, 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 this interaction between public safety and community relations is, is developing and burgeoning and, and is going to um, continue to develop under this. Gotcha. So when you mention licensed social workers, are you talking about LSWs are the ones with the eyes? Now you know what I'm talking about through the chair. Ms. Ballard. Ms. Ballard. We're, um, we're, we're referring to those with an I, the licensed independent social worker, because they can um, provide diagnostic assessment mm -hmm. as opposed to the licensed social worker that usually is supervised by the I. Got it. Thank you. I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. You were well within your time. I appreciate that. Uh, I have, again, on the list, I have Star, Mauer, Slife, Harsh, House. Anyone else wish? Okay, I want to go in, in order. Councilman Starr. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't have that many questions. I basically um, wanted to ask through the, through the chair to the table, more so some in-depth questions um, regarding the relationships that community relations plays in the role of the co-responders, as well as understanding the staffing levels. I am looking at the budget. Um, I do notice that there are um, 10, 10 social workers, and then it says something about mental health dispatch personnel, uh, which is totaling in about 11 different staff, maybe, no, maybe 12, because we have a public safety mental health strategist. Um, I'm just trying to figure out the staffing levels. Um, as far as this um, ordinance or and the amendments that was made, to see if this really is enough for the work that we are asking for the entire city of Cleveland with a population of just a little bit over um, 340,000. Okay, who can, yeah, who so, can explain that? Well, Councilman, through, through the chair first. Just go over the numbers again of where, what do you per perceive to be the numbers working? Chief, do you want to talk about the numbers? Yeah. To the chair, uh, currently, again, the, the program that as it exists, so we'll start there, as it exists is a five co-responder team, uh, one per district. This is one officer and a licensed uh, uh, clinician. What we're trying to do is expand that to 10, uh, 10 teams um, with uh, emphasis uh, with at least one or two teams downtown. So we'd like to have a couple teams per district. As far as the mental health dispatcher, I think when you look at that, it seems singular in nature. But our, our intent, at least my intent, my goal uh, with that uh, uh, to the chair, to Councilman Starr, is to have the vast majority, if not all, of our dispatchers trained uh, in mental health, how to handle mental health calls. So when a call comes in uh, to 911 or 1234, which is our non-emergency number, they'll have the ability to triage those calls and get those individuals the, uh, the treatment they need. So again, hopefully that right there is uh, will increase our numbers and so forth, because again, my plan, my goal is to have all of our dispatchers trained that way. And then um, we have the senior strategist, which would be out of the, uh, the health department. Um, well, that's one individual, so we're hoping to, to have uh, uh, 10, addition, 10, 10 additional, I hope my math is right, uh, officers and uh, counselors uh, assigned to this uh, co-responders unit. But, you know, I don't want you guys to just think that because we also have our response through community relations uh, and what they do and so forth, which is uh, uh, similar to a care response because there's not an officer assigned to their response. Councilman? Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Commander, for that. Um, Chief, rather, my fault. Um, I, I would just ask to that, uh, is, that seems as if if that is some improvements from years past, which is always good to make some improvements. Um, I do applaud small gains, but I'm also just thinking about just the severity and me and my, myself and my colleague, um, Councilwoman House was just discussing amongst each other, you know, just, just the violence in our neighborhood and what type of preventive measurements or what type of proactive ways that we can address those. Um, I, I, I have to bury another child that I've had a mentor throughout my time um, being an activist. Um, DeCarlos was just killed with a stray bullet on Woodhill. 
a kid that graduated from East Tech, spoke at his graduation, used to employ him to do different sports initiatives um, through the work at Boys and Girls Club, but he was doing door nash, um, and a straight bullet hit him. So, so I'm trying to get an understanding of, you know, how do we get more folks in the community um, and how it helps the community relations um, department because I don't think 15 or 20 staff members is enough. Just made me think as you were talking where um, chair to the table was the fact that we have um, five, I mean three community engagement officers um, positions available for all of our uh, police districts which equals a total of 15 if all are filled. And then we're talking about another additional 10 mean staff that are due to co-responders, which equals to about 35 people that's doing preventative work from our budget standpoint. And I'm thinking that's, that's not really enough. Um, and I'm just trying to ask my colleagues, is there something that we can do to make sure we get those boots on the ground? And then also thinking about how we can ask the county to match that um, to the chair. Because, you know, these straight bullets and these access to guns, and, and we did see our colleague wrote a, a columnist in an article about how many guns that are in the city um, and in the streets. And I think in order for you to do that, you have to take those individuals, such as Jock, such as Jacks over in community relations, to put them into neighborhoods and allow them to spread their wings based off the knowledge and the training that they have to do this work. And they need more than just um, two handfuls of staffing. I think we're talking north of 20 to 30 staff members for outreach work just that the city employs on top of whatever any other organization to better help um, serve this. And I thank and I applaud you for all for sending over the presentation. I was able to review it last night and was looking at it. And I see the work is do being done, but let's get it out more to be able to make a bigger impact because we are doing some great work, but let's make sure it's a broader approach so we can address some of these issues. And I just yield, Chair. Thank, thank you, Councilman. Um, I can only, I just want to reinforce to my colleagues the, the challenge that we have and to the viewing public. Council does not hire, we do not fire, we do not deploy, we do not administer. So the challenge is for us, um, we legislate, we pass an annual budget. We're hearing legislation today. So it's up to the administration to deliver the programming. Uh, to administer, and I'm hoping, based on Councilman, okay. um, I, I, one question yeah. to your to, yeah. to your point, um, Chair. So, as a legislator, so we can't write a policy and ask for the administration to implement it. We can recommend. So, if we pass a legislation and we pass an ordinance and saying, "Hey, this is how the program can be shaped up," it is, and I'm just want to make sure I understand yeah. government because. Um, I think we, we, we may miss something on this. And that means is if the administration comes to us with an ordinance and they want this to be passed, if it doesn't pass, it doesn't go through. But if exactly. we wanted to amend something that they brought to us and ask them to do this part of it, yes. that's how they can do it. We, we can amend, uh, to my honorable colleague, we can amend anything at the table. Again, um, it would go through review of law if, in fact, what we did was, was legal under the charter. Um, and under the codified ordinances. Um, but we have the authority at this table to amend, uh, just as the piece before us today is an amended piece. Yep, and then, yeah. and, and just to piggyback on chair to law, so if there's something that I believe is a great preventive measurement for violence and we want to possibly support it and I was able to get the votes from my colleagues to be able to present this and get it to pass through council, and send it over to the administration, it becomes a law, correct? No, it would, it would have to go under review if, if the action that we've taken is legal. Uh, if it's legal, then it, it would be adopted, just like in this amendment. Yeah, so I'm saying like yeah. it would be legal, Chair. Yeah. I'm saying something that is legalized, right. that we got it through law, right. that it was legal, and we pass it through a, as a council. Yep. That yeah. then <clears throat> be, goes into effect, and that is and yes. something that the mayor can then enforce through the administration, yes. right? You're so correct. therefore, we can write something up and recommend adding additional staffing if we see that a number of 30 or 40 is needed and we want to make sure the city is funding that. We can, and through our legislative report. We authority. can recommend staffing levels, but we cannot force them to do that. Chair, Chair Matt. Yes. 
So, um, to the chair, to, to the council members, so as director of health, and, and you're, you're both on the health committee, I would love to look at some policies that we could work on together so you wouldn't have to feel like, you, you, I mean, we could really collaborate and do something good. Yeah, and, and, and right. definitely direct the chair to the director. I'm, I'm open yeah. for that. But sometimes other people don't have the same vision that the ones who are on the front line. And not to say discredit to anyone, because as a collective unit, as legislators, as administration, as people that work for the city, we all are trying to do a good job to be able to work together. But what I'm saying is some things we can as legislators, we can write up and get it passed through to us. I just want to make sure that I'm not confused or, or, or understanding that. But it has to be legal, obviously. But 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 at the same time, it's just it's just confusion on how it seems as if only time something get pushed or only time something is a great idea is if the administration hmm. introduced it. And I thought we were legislators. Wait, wait a minute. There were, um, okay, Councilman. Okay, you have point, Councilman Conwell. What's I mean, your point? You know, when we pass legislation, us as council members, our our main jobs we're the funders. So if we pass this legislation today. You have to bring it back to us quarterly, and we can put that in there. It's in I think there. It's, it's in there. It's in there. And, and you need to hit your benchmarks. If you don't hit your bench, benchmarks, we have oversight. So our job, even when we pass legislation, is to manage it. It's to manage it. And sometimes, um, council members start, well, a lot of times, I stop by and I visit Kerry Howard unannounced, Director Kerry Howard. Okay. David, well, you got some visits coming from me also. So I visit, I don't wait till my three months come up, okay. or I visit Angela Woodson, and sometimes I even call her on the phone on a Sunday while I'm, walk, while I'm doing my walks. Okay. It's seven o'clock in the morning, because we have oversight. So, okay. thank I you. I mean, we just got to stay on top of that oversight, and we have to manage thank policy. Thank you. Okay, Councilman Starr. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you again for keeping time. Councilwoman Maurer. <sighs> thank you so much. Sorry. Um, I really appreciate the robust discussion today. I have too many questions to ask in my 15 minutes. I know. I've been studying. My team has been studying. That was why I had my phone out, because I was talking with my team member, who I think you know cares very passionately about this issue. Um, yes. Um, so I'm going to break down my questions into three broad buckets. Um, the first is about um, co-response versus care response. The second are some kind of technical questions on drafting. Uh, and then the third are some questions on social workers and uh, the idea of a dedicated team for uh, the downtown unhoused population. So um, to start with on um, co-response versus care response, I was wondering, Director, um, if you could explain the difference between those two models. Director? Through the chair. Sure. The, um, the, the co-response is uh, social workers with law enforcement officers. That's, that's the simplest way to, way to put it. Yeah. It's, it's police responding, um, and it's CIT trained police responding with, with, with uh, mental health professionals. The care response does not involve um, police, a police response. These would be non-police officers responding to a, uh, a mental health crisis. So sorry, to say that one more time, you're saying that the, the co-responder model, we have non-police responding, but they are responding. No, no, no. no. co-responder is police. Yeah. Care, no police. Oh, perfect. Thank you. I, I apologize. I, I, I missed that. Um, uh, so I heard you say at the top that you mentioned care response as something that um, we value. And I'm wondering if you could ex um, further explain that a little bit more. So I, I, out of public safety comes, comes the, the co-response program. That's the law enforcement officers with the mental health professionals. The care response is going to be, uh, we're looking at the Department of Community Relations. Um, and I would, I would defer to um, Director Woodson on how that would operate or what she envisions in that. I don't want to speak for her, but, th but that, that care response, that non-law enforcement response would come out of the Department Let of Community Relations. Director Woodson, please come to the table to the right of the here over here, Ange over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best seat. <laughs> Director Woodson, you heard the question. 
to the chair and to the councilwoman. Um, working with safety, we are trying to evaluate our team, even as Councilman Starr has shared. Um, we are of three in youth diversion and three of street outreach. Based on this model, and if passing, uh, it would allow us to go back to reevaluate to try to hire more staff, and especially social workers, because we only have one. <laughs> She's behind me who heads our uh, youth diversion team. So that's what this legislation would allow us to do to be able to, to comply with the CARE model. Fantastic. Um, and that is actually a great lead-in to, to my question, which is that um, if we are supportive of a care response model in addition to co-responder, which I think we are, um, I would love to propose an amendment to make sure to include that language in the whereas clauses of this legislation so that we're explicit that that is a goal, um, particularly of the senior strategists, that they would think about ways to produce programming along that continuum of both co-responder and care. Um, so my thought was um, in the header of the, um, and, and we can, formally do these chair uh, at the time of the other amendments, but my thought was to add um, at the beginning of the first clause at the top, um, authorizing the director of public safety or appropriate director to employ one or more professional consultants to develop and implement a strategic plan to expand the crisis intervention team co-responder program and explore opportunities towards care response. In the top of the document, and then insert a whereas clause that said, um, whereas care response has a proven track record of improving community outcomes and decreasing workload for police departments, the city desires for this project to explore care response models as a supplement to co-response. Director, you have any thoughts along uh, those lines? I have no objection to Director that. of Health. I'm very supportive of that amendment to chair. Okay, so um, you, can you prepare that so we can get it to the law, or the law director get that? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's, it's in my very messy handwriting, um, but since we have that on the on the table, maybe I mean, we're discussing it. Would that be okay to at, propose? Yeah, at some, and, and I, I will revert back to you as soon as we are through with the other questions because there might be other amendments. Great. So uh, um, I will revert. So Keith, if you can get that over to the, mm -hmm. so he can prepare that for you. Okay. Oh, Good. no, no one looks at my handwriting. I will type it up. Okay. I will type it up later. <laughs> so we, we have time. We have time on that amendment. Uh, Ms. Maurer, any other questions? Yes. Okay, that? great. So this was my first bucket. I'm going to move on to my second uh, bucket of questions, which is a little bit more technical um, and is broadly around the question of um, the drafting. So first of all, um, I was looking at the other ARPA um, programming, and all of them have a clause that says um, this... Uh, the, 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 the expenses under this ordinance are not to exceed X amount. It's clear from the summary that we have a goal amount for this program, but there is no language in this um, bill that I can find that explicitly names the cap for this program. And I was wondering if that was intentional or if that's something that we need to make clear in this, leg in this legislation. Director, so the difference being is that these, this five million $56,295 is dedicated for this, and the spending of it is going to be, is going to be based on you know, um, salary analysis, um, cost of supplies, cost of equipment. The, the legislation that has the cap is just saying that um, there's no required amount of money to be spent. It just cannot go over this amount of money. So this is a designated, um, designated amount of funds for uh, dedicated to crisis intervention. Right, and could you just point me to where we lay out that that is the dedicated amount to crisis intervention in the language of the bill? It's, Through um, the chair? Director. This legislation will fund public safety, mental health strategists, licensed social workers, social workers and other similar professionals, mental health dispatch personnel and equipment for the crisis intervention team, and then it goes into the, to the equipment for that. Um, and where is that in the... Ms. Bill, Mauer. I apologize. Sorry, Ms. Mauer. Yeah, I was looking at it through the summary. <laughs> yeah, this, this this is I think there's a this is going to be my questions is I think there's a little bit of discrepancy between the summary and the language, so I just want to make sure I'm being clear about what um, what we're covering. He's a lawyer, so it's okay. <laughs> Give me one moment. Right, that's just not in there. Two. 
So in section one, um, the, the, that the director of public safety or appropriate director is authorized to employ by contract or contract one or more consultants or one or more firms or consultants for the purpose of supplementing the regularly employed staff of the several departments of the city of Cleveland in order to provide professional services necessary to develop and implement a strategic plan to expand crisis intervention team uh, co-responder program. I think that that encompasses it, but it, it's, it's um, that's as, as explicit, I believe, as the, the legislation gets. Okay, thank you. And and that kind of clears, clarifies for me. I just think as a, I, I just want us to think on the, both sides of the table about whether we need to insert that to make it sort of consistent with the other ARPA bills, because the other thing I'll note is that the amendments that are proposed to include a senior strategist, which I think are, are going to be um, uh, discussed at length um, in this conversation, I would, I would note that those are, in amen those are in the amendments. It's amendment number two, and it's only an insertion in the whereas clause. It's, a, it's in the whereas clause that we include a senior level strategist and approximately 10 licensed social workers um, or other similar professionals. But then that concept of a senior strategist and social workers is not listed anywhere in the legislation itself that, that I can find. And to mirror that issue in section nine of the legislation itself, it says the cost of professional services and standard contracts authorized shall be paid from fund number 119997. Mm -hmm. So my concern is that currently the legislation as drafted doesn't anticipate a senior level strategist and the 10 social workers in the body of the length of the bill itself the way we are anticipating it in the summary. Director. Through the chair. So, uh, looking at the, the heading for the emergency ordinance, I think that, um, and I, I would have to ask you know law to give their interpretation of this, but um, at the heading of it, uh, an emergency ordin ordinance authorizing the director of public safety or appropriate director to employ one or more professional consultants to develop and implement a strategic plan to expand the crisis intervention. Um, I won't read the entire thing, but the, 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 the legislation um, is for the purpose of doing what it states with regard to expansion of the co-responder program and now the language um, which we're grateful for the amendment to explore the care response program, um, the, the subject matter of the legislation is for that purpose. Got it. And, and I think that might just be a question for law about whether this adequately captures the goals, uh, what I think are very, very clear in the summary, in the conversation today. I think we're all on the same page about what we want in this. And my only thought here is just making sure that the language of the bill okay. itself comports with okay. what our shared understanding then is. Let, let me, uh, Mr. Law Director, do you have any comment? It, it sounds to me like uh, the uh, amendment on this would be <coughs> expand perhaps section one to You have the director, you directors, do you have any objection to that? The only um, comment I would have is with naming a, an amount of staff, um, depend, it, 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 it may fluctuate depending on what, I don't know what the, the average salary is, I don't know how salaries have changed yeah. with regard to the current economic environment. That, I, I if we if say, it, me, yeah, it, sure. There we go. Yeah. Then, if, mm -hmm. if the money isn't there to hire them, then you're, sure. you're not going to be able to do it. But you have the option to hire up, to, so you wouldn't be required to hire up to the ten and have them do the work. Right. 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 Because that way, if we have that language in, the, in a working clause, we can clarify which department that strategist will actually sit in. So I, I think that, that will be helpful for all of us. Um, I know I've used up a lot of time, but um, that 
resolves my key drafting questions. And uh, with my remaining time, um, I will move into some more um, substantive concerns. Um, and then after I wrap up, I will, I will type up my amendment and maybe that edit to the um, first working first section of the bill so that we can circulate that. Okay, okay so um, I've, I've rounded my way through um, care response, uh, through these technical questions on drafting, and now I'm, I'm gonna work my way to some questions on the social workers um, and, and our uh, question of how we work with the city's homeless population. So I, I wanna note um, on the slide uh, this says, how our, will ARPA dollars expand and improve these services? The last bullet point is um, funding. Uh, funding would assign one to two co-responder teams to downtown Cleveland to focus on the homeless population in crisis. And I, I'm wondering through the chair to the director, um, have we um, contemplated that work in... Um, have we run this past NEOC, Northeast Ohio Coalition for the Homeless, which does a profound amount of our street outreach in the city um, and, and really is very involved with that community through the chair? To, to the chair, Chief. Uh, Councilwoman, um, uh, we work uh, with uh, them, um, and if we're going to expand, if it's approved, uh, we will work with them and make sure they provide service again to the uh, un, 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 unhoused uh, uh, individuals and so forth. So we work with them. They're the experts. Um, I know that the third district commander, when Commander Todd was there, which is not Deputy Chief Todd, she worked with them, and I know the current commander there as well worked with them as well. So that's something we would do and collaborate with them to see what's best or the best way to uh, help those folks that are not housed. Fantastic. I, I know that um, just in my brief conversations with them, one thing that they're very clear about is that um, they really want to work off of a care response model um, rather than a co-responder model for the downtown population. And so I'm a little bit concerned about this being a dedicated place for co-responder teams rather than a care response team. Um, and I, I want to make sure that... Um, you know, one thing, for instance, we don't have street outreach in the evenings right now. Um, we don't have street outreach dedicated to RTA stops. Um, and so there are clear places where a pure care response model um, can dramatically improve our response to the downtown, um, to, to our entire um, homeless and unhoused population. So I really want to hit home that um, my goal here would be to have a care response for, for this community in particular. Okay. okay. To the chair, the councilwoman, uh, I, of course, uh, I'm open to that as well. Again, whatever is best for our community and especially unhoused community, uh, we will uh, work with that. Okay. The, okay. the councilwoman's time is up, and I'll, well, I'll head her back to the list. Are you, I don't care, any response to that? Uh, yeah, we're f fully supportive of that, and uh, NEOC's a great partner, as, as Chief okay. said. Um, do you want to make your one note on the amendment of the up to 10? Yeah, just um, up to 10 is, is um, to Councilman Starr, he had raised it, you know, growing this as yep. much as we can, saying up to limits us. So if we need to, you know, if we have it within the budget and it's successful, being limited at 10 disallows us to go to 12. So it's, it's, it's maybe if we keep the number around an approximate. Yeah, or, be best. or what if we said senior strategists and social workers? Sure. Yeah. Okay, oh, sure. fine. Yeah. Okay, um, I have Councilman Slife. <laughs> Right. Uh, just as a starter, thank you, Councilman Poletsik, and, and also to Council President Griffin for allowing this to be a joint hearing of, of safety as, as well as the health committee. Um, obviously, this is a, a, a program and a mechanism that's being built out of, of public safety. And uh, but However, we, we are at the end of the day talking about health needs, and I think it's important that we look at this uh, from those, those two lenses at the same time. It's really valuable. And also, thank you to Ms. Ballard. I was One of my questions was going to be, a, a good community to uh, uh, if it have the possibility to understand how they've implemented the similar strategy of a parallel co-response uh, care response model. So I wrote down Baltimore. I guess my only request would be if there's individuals in Baltimore that we would be able to reach out to. I'm, I'm, I, I tend to be an experiential learner and a slow learner with lots of questions. So not something that I could have a conversation with more than 15 minutes of questions at this table will uh, be helpful for me. Um, and one of the reasons I want to do that, you know, a couple weeks ago, um, 
one of my questions has been how, how these situations play out in real time and not just in theory sitting at this table and, and how do people know whether to call 911 or at 988 and how does a dispatcher uh, able to kind of direct a call when the person might not know that there's two options to choose from. A couple weeks ago there was a uh, police involved shooting in Ward 17, a um, man who seems to have been experiencing a mental health crisis uh, flagged down CMHA police and it it, it turned physical and violent. He was shot and killed. And uh, you know, and, and knowing that, I don't know. You know, we can come up with the best model, but would that situation have been, uh, you know, preventable? Um, you know, in a, in a, in a uh, classic case of Cleveland being a, a, a big small town, I uh, learned a family member that uh, worked really closely within this building. It was it was re related to this individual, so it was it was, a, it was a tough loss. But if the question being, if we're able to, uh, if Baltimore's the example, if there's ways that we could be tied in with the people who lead that program, those programs in Baltimore, I think to understand how we can bring it to Cleveland. Um, one more comment, uh, just as I sit here, and I will uh, nod to staff for kind of putting this in my brain. Um, you know, Mr. President, uh, and I'll say the same thing, or Mr. Chair, I'll say the same thing to the president. Um, you know, I haven't gone through violence and eruption training. I haven't gone through uh, mental health uh, response. And you know, we're out in the community too, and, and you know, not in the same way, but uh, we engage with residents. I think we've all been in a situation where we're called to a neighbor's house and it seems to be mental health related. So it might be valuable for us to go through some kind of training like that. I think that it would help us in our day-to-day -day work, but also allow us to be able to uh, be a little more informed as, as we work on these big policy issues. So I'll mention that to the president. He's, you know, exceptionally qualified to lead that himself, if, 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 if need be. But I think it'd be valuable. Um, thank you, Councilman Moore, uh, who has stepped out because I, I, she covered a lot of my questions and concerns with her proposed amendments. The one thing, the one hangup that I still have is where the division of EMS is involved in this process. EMS is not at the table right now. EMS is not referred to in uh, the body of the ordinance. And, and I guess my question back to uh, you know the other side of the table is how is EMS envisioned to be involved in care response and co-response? Director? Thank you, Director. So um, our officers will call EMS if, they, if the situation arises and, and, they, and they, do, they do show up. But EMS is, is, is mandated to um, deal with physical health crises um, and, and when they transport folks, to transport them to an institution that can provide a higher level of care than they can provide. That is what their mandate is, is, is currently. The, um, the fact that we have um, uh, EMS to arrive on scene if the, if the situation warrants um, even fire to, to our arrive on scene to meet with uh, to to meet phys um, matters of, of uh, physical condition is 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 really where we are right now. Any discussion um, about in, enveloping EMS into the co-response program would involve a lot of conversation with Dr. Collins, whose license EMS operates under, um, and to get his professional um, uh, input. Um, he's the one who would. Really, I kind of educate us on what EMS is permitted to do under its under its, under his license. Okay, um, Mr. Chair, uh, you know I'll just I'll just say in a forthcoming way I I will have difficulty supporting this ordinance until those conversations have happened and there, there, there's a, a larger attempt to understand EMS's role in this. I mean, respectfully, if that's the legal charge of EMS, uh, then, then I can test the legal charge of EMS. I think that historically uh, in this country, we've thought of everything from the neck down as healthcare and everything from the head up isn't. That's something else that's mental and the brain's an organ. That, you know, and just in the same way that uh, you could have a heart attack or a stroke, uh, you could have a kidney issue, you can also have issues with the brain, which is an organ. So I, I, I dislike this idea of, of maintaining the separation. And, and I think that, you know, a mental health crisis is as much a physical health issue as breaking a leg. Um, so, so I, I, 
I would like for those conversations to happen and to, to suss out what the role of EMS is. And, and uh, there, there's a number of reasons for that, but one is uh, through the chair, uh, who is transporting to the ER? Director. Trans so when, if, 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 if co-response comes and someone needs to be transported to the ER, is EMS transporting them to the ER? To the chair, to the councilman, that's, that's a very good question. I think it, it, it varies, um, depending on the situation. Uh, EMS, uh, again, great partners, uh, uh, the vision of EMS. Um, if it's a situation where it's volatile and the individual um, will not get into a police car, uh, we'll call EMS to transport, and they will transport to the ER. Again, it just depends on the situation. Sometimes our officers are, resp are, are conveying those individuals, um, just like our officers are conveying them to the uh, diversion centers and so forth. And again, it just depends on the situation. Okay. Thank you. Can I get a point? Go ahead. What, what's the specific point? On, on this EMS piece here, um, Council Member, you are definitely correct, and to the uh, chair, to the safety director, I've been on ride-alongs with, with EMS several times, matter of fact, numerous of times, and we've ran into uh, mental health issues. And they should be in, that, in the scope of this, uh, this program. They should be in there. Okay. And, and you, hit, you hit that point. And I witnessed Saturday at 1, p 1 p.m., sorry for pointing to you, um, Director, I was in front of University Hospital, and there was a mental uh, case going on with the uh, University Hospital Police. And I got, and I dialed, nine, I dialed 911 to EMS to come in to help, which you just mentioned. They're in that paradigm. They're baked in, as he just mentioned. Okay. The, Thank the, you. The but chair, I'm, I'm chairing yeah, also, Michael. Yeah, I know. I'm yeah. chairing too, yeah. as well. So you can answer it. Okay, yeah, great. No, thank you to, to the chairs, um, to, right. the, to the councilman. And, and yeah, thank you. So I, what I think we would all hope is that when the senior strategist comes on board, with health that they'll be able to evaluate the whole continuum of care. Dr. Tom Collins is a mentor to me and a good friend. And I think you know, we're willing to look at all of this uh, as we develop out the strategy. So I think you know, what this legislation would allow us to do is to have those conversations yes. and explore this further. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Slight. Thank you. I, I will um, uh, request the, uh, to a uh, staff, I would be interested in the data um, of the percentage of cases where people are transported to the emergency room, okay. uh, who we is transporting make, them. We will make that request. Mm -hmm. sure. You can provide that to us. Sure. And Councilman Slife, Councilman Conwell bring up very valid points. Uh, we cannot think of EMS as a standalone operation. Uh, we've got to figure out how they're going to interact here. Yeah. So, and very good point. Chair, if I may make a point, I don't want what, you know, I don't know if it was, if it was if it, my tone to be misconstrued. It's not that I, desire to keep EMS out of it. I'm simply going over the process of what has to happen. I, I can't speak for Dr. Collins' license, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I don't have the, the, the knowledge okay. to speak to the regulations that govern EMS. That's why I, what I'm saying is that there's a process, as Dr. Margolis has said, a discussion for this to unfold and to figure out what okay. EMS's role may be. But, but, but they brought up valid points, so sure. let's figure out. And, and, and thank you, Director. And, and, you know, I think one of the reasons it's worth exploring is simply because, uh, you know, it's sitting here slightly un, uninformed on the complexities of Dr. Collins' licensure, uh, is it's, there's certainly been cases in the past where the problem to uh, implementation has actually been the city of Cleveland and our own laws and our own regulations and policies. So what do we need to do, if anything, to, uh, you know, bring ourselves into the 21st century to, to allow things to be more successful, you know, and more effective? You know, the other, the other reason, Mr. Chair, why I, I'm really passionate about EMS being involved um, is my understanding is that the current social workers that partner with police are either from Murtis Taylor or Frontline Services. Is that correct through the chair? Through the chair, to the councilman, okay. that's correct. Okay. Thank you. And and I am I am not a HIPAA attorney, and uh, but I do know that HIPAA isn't whatever we want it to be. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, it's. it's Having my, my understanding is that Frontline and Murtis Taylor, Mr. Chair, aren't able to necessarily share information with each other due to HIPAA laws. Uh, however, my, my, my hope is that by having EMS involved as, some, as, as a clinician, essentially, uh, that we're able to be able to provide more seamless services to people because there's a continuity that is able to function within laws that, that, that pertain to health care disclosure. Okay. Um, 
so with that, Mr. Chair, you know, I, I, I guess my question or my comment is that I, I think that these conversations need to occur. I'm not, I'm not prepared at this time to offer any specific amendment legislation. Uh, I will just say that in my past conversations with, with the administration about uh, co-response, one of the concerns that, I, that had been shared with me about bringing EMS into the fold does relate to staffing, and, and I, I don't want to uh, negate the, the challenge right now and, and all the work that's happening with staffing across public safety, but I also don't want to uh, use that as a crutch to not aspire for the best okay. possible solution. Okay. Um, and with that, I will, I will close, and as, as these conversations continue, if amendment language can be, uh, I can circle down on more specific amendment language, I'll be happy to share it with you. And I th again, you and Councilman Conwell brought up very valid points, and, uh, and I'm hoping the uh, administration heard us, heard you, and um, we'll, uh, because obviously we're not through with this piece, and um, want to make sure what, what, what we pass is going to be um, as effective and incorporating as possible. So, my, Councilman Harsh, you're up next. And again, I thank all my colleagues for keeping your time. Thank you, Chairman. I should pull up my clock then. Um, I, I hate to, to, to spring stats on everyone, but uh, through the chair to the director, could we have a ballpark estimate of how many 911 calls are received in the city of Cleveland every year? Uh, I don't have that information, but I can get that for you. Through the chair, are we talking tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands? Do we think it's over 100,000? Do we think it's... To, to, to the chair, is, to the chair it will be hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Yes. yes. Okay, and through the chair then, 5,000 calls are routed to CIT. Chief. To, to the chair, to the council, I... I well, I don't know if it's necessarily routed. I understand your question. Uh, to the chair, Councilman, I don't know if it's necessarily routed. We have calls that came in so far. They responded, and it ended up being crisis intervention situations where they're filling out a form. So thank you to the chair to the director. That gets to my, my, my point. How is 911 dispatch deciding when to send a CIT team currently? Chief? To the chair, to, to, to the Councilman, that's a good question. Again, depends. it just depends on how the call comes in. And if that information is given to the dispatcher at that particular time, again, uh, it just depends. Uh, someone may say, well, you know, my son, my daughter, my loved one is having some mental issues or, uh, they're suffering from, and they say, well, whatever the case might be. The officers will, at that particular time, will respond to the scene. What the dispatchers generally do in that situation is try to find a CIT trained officer to respond to that particular scene. Once the officers get there, they evaluate it and so forth. Uh, if they can't handle it, they'll call for if between the hours, depending if our uh, if our co-responders are okay. working. So, uh, so th 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 thank you, Chief. So um, the dispatchers are taking context from the call itself to decide if this is a, uh, an applicable case for a CIT, a co-response team. To the chair, that's that's a fair assessment. Yes. Okay. Uh, through the chair, does this ever delay the response time? Chief. To the chair, to the uh, councilman, um, I don't believe so. Uh, what happens in those particular situations is as the information comes in, the call taker is sending that information to our dispatcher, who in turn will start getting uh, the cars moving there. So the call taker is constantly getting information in, putting that information into the system. That information is populated to the dispatcher. The dispatcher sees that and gives that information out to the uh, call, to the uh, cars. Okay. Um, and so I understand, Mr. Chair, that the goal is to have a separate number that people could call for mental health crisis that would actually sidestep some of this and allow the, uh, a mental health crisis to be routed entirely separately. But through the chair to the chief, if a person calls asking for the police, it's not the habit of the dispatcher to question them about that request. Director, Correct. chief. D can you repeat that? I'm sorry. When a person calls 911 and says, I need the police, the dispatcher would never say, well, are you sure about that? No, absolutely not. To the chair, the councilman, no. If they say they need the police, the police is coming. Okay. Um, because it also gets to some of the questions that I have about how we uh, diagnose cases when officers are en route. Um, through the chair, is the vision to have the proper officer sent to every call, or the, uh, the, is the vision to have every officer be able to handle every call? 
Chief. To, to the chair, Councilman, our goal is to try to triage the calls initially through our, our, our dispatchers to make sure we have the appropriate response to the call for service. Um, ideally, I would like to have all my officers who are CIT trained uh, for um, um, the situations that they're running across. Um, but uh, I think um, sometimes uh, with officers, we're, we're, we're jack of all trades, as you're probably aware. Mm -hmm. You know, people expect us to handle everything from barking dog to someone with threat, threatening with a gun and so forth. So we try to give our officers as much training as possible, but sometimes our officers just don't know what they're running into. But our goal relative to CIT is to have dispatchers uh, or call takers able to triage the calls and so forth and then get those uh, individuals the help that they need. But we will not turn down someone that's calling for uh, CPD to respond. And, and if I may that, add to that, uh, Councilman through the Chair, is that that's why the, the call takers, it's important for them to keep the caller on the line so they can continue to gather information, ask clarifying questions, and to relay that information to the, to the responding officers. If the responding officers do arrive on scene in a situa that situation that they cannot handle, then they'll call a certified CIT officer and we'll try to send a certified CIT officer there. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, to elaborate what the Chief said, we would love for every officer to lean forward and to you know, be um, proactive and, and be certified in, in CIT, but we want the right officers who, who, uh, who have the heart for this kind of work. Some officers, you can imagine, um, as, as diverse as the, as, the, as the division is, may not, be, may not have the personality for, for crisis intervention, and that officer has, to, has the wherewithal to back off and call in someone who does. Okay, um, so moving into the actual uh, application of, the, of this idea. So currently we have five teams that are composed of one officer and one clinician, one per police district. The goal is to have 10 more teams, so a total of three teams per district. Is that correct to the chair? Chief, director. That's fair. Okay. Council Chair, that's fair. And, and so the funding in here is specifically for the clinicians because the officers are already on staff, correct? To the chair, to councilman, that is correct. Okay, and so that would be three per team. The, the teams work from noon to 10 p.m. Is that a Monday through Friday job, or do they work weekends? Two, I, I, two, is, there, is there a two, peak period for mental instability? It really, it really is, yes. There is a peak period for mm -hmm. mental, for a call for crises. Yes, there is a peak time for them. That's what listed in there. There is a, a peak time. That's ideally when we would like our officers working. Our officers generally work a 10-hour shift. So, and they have different days off and so forth. So we're covering all the uh, hours necessary mm -hmm. and seven days a week. It's seven days a week and we cover those hours when it's peak, uh, when we receive peak calls for crises, folks in crisis. Councilman Harsh. Okay, so, the, I, so just, to, just to be clear, so currently the teams work five days a week or, or four days a week. And you see they're 10 hour shifts, they can't work five days a week. Um, they wrote. They have different days off, so we make sure we have uh, the coverage. But currently, there's only one team per district. Correct. So they can't work all seven days. No, they do not. That's correct. Right. So the idea would be to cover up those laps, have all seven days covered, noon to ten, and then the third team maybe in different shifts. Like yes, that's correct. Okay. okay. To the chair, to the councilman, that's correct. Yeah, sure, of course. Um, okay, then. We are looking to put the, um, the strategist in health department, but we want the CARES people in community development, and we want the whole thing dispatched through public you, safety. You mentioned community development, not community I'm development. I'm sorry. Relations. Community relations. relations. I'm sorry. My apologies. For their community relations. Would it make more sense to have the, and I, through the chair to the anybody, I suppose, would it make more sense to have all of this housed in the health department since we're dealing with mental health and have those clinicians answer to the strategists who would be overseeing this from a mental health perspective? But why are we putting those clinicians in community relations, and no disrespect, okay. um, instead of the health department, we're going to put the strategists? So, uh, can both direct or all three directors comment on that? Sure. So, to, to the chair, to the, to the councilman. So, uh, to have uh, FT in our department means that 
uh, I and the health department would be making folks schedules, uh, approving vacation requests, uh, giving constructive feedback uh, to, to the work they're doing. And so these folks are already working closely uh, within public safety, and so it makes sense for them to continue to do that for, to expand on the work they're doing. In regards to community relations, there's already this wonderful street outreach team that we're talking about expanding. And so I don't, we don't need to disrupt things to the point where I'm taking that you know, away from other departments. So, so through the chair to the director, so is the street outreach team then the CARES response? Is that what we're gonna call CARES response, director? To the chair, to the councilman. It's a combination of both, I think, what they're trying to say within their presentation today and what the health director is sharing. So the street team, in addition to a social worker clinician, would go together. It wouldn't be just them solo mm -hmm. out to make the like an overall assessment. It's like a group of us that will work together for the assessment. Mainly the street team does know these neighborhoods quite well. Um, they have what we call street credibility. So sometimes them coming on the scene can, especially in these types of situations, just by identity and by who they are and their relationships deep in the community can sometimes get a mentally ill person to settle down. Mm -hmm. um, whereas having a clinician on site can best like kind of assess where do we need to take this individual with the actual street team member. I, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm asking because I'm kind of not sure where we're trying to get ultimately with the co-response versus care response and how we're going to envision this being constructed within our department. So it sounds like your street team is sort of the first level of, of interaction perhaps. And if it escalates, then you need a, a clinician with, a, with an officer perhaps and a co-response model. And then if that doesn't get handled, then we might need you know a, a full-blown law enforcement and, 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 and squad cars. Mm -hmm. Is that like a continuum of, of, of attempting to start at the lowest level of escalation and well, work our way up if, as if, need be? If I may, Councilman, through the chair, I think that it, it's, it's situation dependent, yeah. right? It, it's, it, cause, because there may be a situation where um, the co-response model should be the initial response as opposed to working up to that response. It depends on the facts um, that come across. Um, first, if, if if they're, if they're calling 911 and our call takers determine, based off of the facts, if the co-response is the appropriate um, response, that's what should respond. As we look at the care response and, and contemplate a, a number that does not go through police, that does not go through 911, that's, that would be a, a care response, again, based fact specific. Someone may, may very well call either of these lines and be, di and be directed to the other. Uh, the other. Uh, depending okay. on, on, the, on the fact. So it's not, a, it's not necessarily, a, what I'm saying is not necessarily a layer. It's not let's try this first and then do this. It's going to be fact dependent on the situation. Councilman? Um, basically, to the chair, to the councilman, I wanted to piggyback on the chief's uh, comments, but also it's, as we've been saying, it's trying to send non-police individuals first mm -hmm. to the scene. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of different cooperation when there's actually individuals that are not in uniform, um, where we're trying to, to limit that kind of engagement so they don't feel like they're going to be arrested and add more anxiety to the situation either. Okay, I think I, think I get it, and I'll be happy to. Um, Mr. Chair, so it seems like we have a vision here of a separate dispatch number for care response, where people would call specifically asking for a care response. Um, I imagine a lot of these would be family and friends of people that have uh, mental issues that know what's needed at the time and they don't want to call 911, but they know they need to call somebody. Whereas a 911 call dispatcher will have to use contextual clues to decide if they should be dispatching a, a co-response team to, to, to a caller who's asking for immediate um, uh, 911 response. Uh, and those two would be separate dispatches. We were, does, does, am I barking up the right tree here? Does this sound like the vision? It, it, it does. I don't want, I, what I don't want to do is I don't want to, one, I don't want to mislead the public to think that there's this number already is, is Correct. in existence. Because we've been okay. talking about Fair. the number. Sure. So depending on when someone comes in, right? So the other, the other part is that it, it, f it hasn't fully been hashed out how these how these two work and how they'll communicate with each other if they need to. Um, we are in the very early stages of, of, of working that out. So I don't, I, I don't also, I also don't want to spot, talk in definitiveness with regard to what these, these functions of these numbers are going to be when we haven't had that 
um, we haven't worked out those details. Okay. Right, and just to piggyback on that, the, the, to the chair, to the, the council member, that's what the purpose of the strategist, strategist. is, to help figure that out. Um, we're not gonna sort that all out at the table, but mm -hmm. there are incredible experts both at the table and in the room and across the country that we're going to be you know, coordinating with to, to figure out the okay. best overall strategy. Okay, and, and uh, Chair, I believe my, you put on the um, then my last question uh, is, um, so the, the, the 5 million ARPA allocation is to get this up and running for three years of two one-year extensions eligible upon your, I believe, request or, or whatever. Um, would the long-term goal then be to just fold this whole thing into the operation of the safety budget? Director. Safety department budget. No, I, th I think that as we sit here today, the long-term goal is to have a uh, an established and operable co-responder program under public safety and a care response program under the Department of Community Relations. The care response program should, is, is, is envisioned right now to be separate from public safety. Right. Okay. Okay. Council Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We kept time. Okay. Uh, Councilwoman House. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so through the uh, chair, uh, to the director, um, I have like, it's like four different categories, but I'm actually, um, in looking at this amendment, um, I, I wanna have a question about this approximately 10 licensed social workers, social workers or other professionals. Um, why was that? Thought, and I'm to, to get to the point. So many times, just because you have go through a training does not mean you're the best person to do the work. Um, and I think we are um, severely inhibiting our ability to be effective for change, um, not valuing the lived experiences of people. Like being a homeless person, you know, that, that's a lived experience that can add value in a co-response model. Even when you look at the care response model and the people that it, that that may bring, I do not think that we should limit um, people's capabilities. You know, hence, for example, my colleague, Chris Harsh. I think Chris Harsh is probably a really brilliant person. He doesn't have a degree. Does that mean he is incapable of going into, you know, some of these things? No, most people can be trained for anything in six months. And so I guess I, I and again, I don't think we should design things based on the system at, as is. We should think about design things about around where we can go. You know what I'm saying? And I, like I said, this, and it's a whole thing about work and all this type of stuff. Many times when we put requirements that you have to be licensed here, you have to do this, it eliminates a significant amount of people in Cleveland who will not be able to get a job, who are actually qualified based on their lived experiences. And so I really think this is something that we should look at and we can have a much broader conversation about this. It's, it's evidence-based and all that type of stuff. But I, I just want to bring it to this group because when I saw it, I was like, uh, and I don't know the language that we can use uh, for that. Is that something that y'all open to? I know that was a long time, but I, I needed to ask the, I needed to put the context in of what I'm saying um, in order to even see what the appetite is, or even if there's a thought around how we look at who is qualified to do a job. Would someone care to comment on yeah, that? Yeah, I'll take that. To the chair, to the councilwoman, um, my street team, most of them don't have degrees. They're, they're all for lived experience. So in addition, I think, and, I, and I'm very open to what you say and appreciate what you say, uh, as far as the degree piece and the social work piece. Um, I think under the CARE model, that's why the street team is being attached to this model because of the fact they have lived experiences um, and knowledge base, which those are the individuals we're trying to hire in the department to work alongside of the social workers, if that, if that helps. So I hear you, but that, we're not talking about a care model today. This, this policy that's in front of this is regarding um, uh, the, this co-responder model, correct? Yeah. There's, there's no dollars attached to a care response. 
Don. To, to chair to the council member, so with the strategist position, that individual is charged, thanks to this amendment specifically spelled out and helping to build that that model. So you're right in that the funds don't directly to building that, but I think pretty quickly we would be able to to use this legislation to build that model per the amendment. Yeah, but there's no money in here for a care model. I mean, that's the point is there. There is no money in here for funding anybody for a care model. That's what this. I'm looking at the. I mean, this. 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 Um, who, who can? No. So. So. The, so minute. that's what the point of the time. The strategy is, is for. So these funds is for a crisis intervention team. The approach can be care or co-responder. So it's 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 not that these funds have to be have to be specifically spent for the co-responder. If the strategist come, uh, um, puts together a way for us to have both, and we we piece and, and is uh, is giving us a program, these funds would 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 fund both as crisis intervention. Okay. So no. Again, I'm I'm okay. So when you look at the budget, it is says a licensed social worker salary and benefits because that's where the majority of the money is going toward. That's, there's, if you say it's all the money is going for licensed social workers, there is no money for anyone else. I, I, I just, I'm, just, I'm just asking a question. What, what's the point? Fine. What? Okay, so state I, I, your point. I, I would welcome clarification, but I think the idea is that care response is non-police. So these social workers that we're budgeting here could be implemented in a care response way. So the, the amendments that we made today actually help us make sure that this money can be used for care response because the social workers themselves, especially if they're housed in community relations, would be part of a care response approach. Okay, again, I'm just getting back to okay. how we are defining professionals. Okay. And I, I'm saying if you only, you know, ordinance are defining the only people that can work is licensed social workers, then it prohibits anybody else from being a part of the model. Totally. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying, looking at the language. According to what we have right now, you have to be a licensed social worker. We had the conversation about what type of certification with the I, with the social worker, which prohibits anybody else from being it. Mm -hmm. it right. uh, is, is that, I'm just. Through the chair, to the, to the council member. Thank, no, thank you, and, and like Director uh, Shoot Woodson said, also with you on that, and I, I think the amendment with the or similar professionals mm -hmm. On there, I, I, I think that gives us room. But to if explore. it's going, and I, I don't know, under, this is going into like the civil service things and what people qualify. You know what I'm saying? That like the level of detail of what is looking at many times, again, according to our rules, if you put these specific explicit requirements, it eliminates people who could be qualified to do the work. That's all I'm saying. Um, but folks are going to do what they to, want to do. To so I'm chair, gonna, I'm gonna oh, wait, on. wait a minute. Through one at a time here. Chief. To Chair, uh, Councilwoman, um, I certainly understand your question and, and I appreciate it. I think we're talking about the co-responders and let's just kind of separate it from care. We I, should, but to your point, uh, with the uh, social, with the co-responders as we're talking about, um, I think for liability purposes, it's important that we have the licensed clinicians and so forth because um, un unfortunately sometimes things go south and they go south really fast and uh, one of the, the questions that generally uh, gets asked by attorneys whether from the, the city's uh, standpoint or otherwise is uh, the individuals that responded to that particular incident were they trained and of course our sworn law, law enforcement officers are and then the next person is going to be there it's maybe a licensed clinician social worker and so those uh, I think from a liability standpoint it's important that we have individuals that are qualified and trained specifically to deal with those type of situations that we're, 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 we would be dealing with and again I hope that helps answer your questions I know it's probably not going to answer it completely but I hope that helps and one of the reasons why we have the license uh, clinicians and social workers and that's not to exclude people okay any, so, any of the rest of the directors want to comment along those lines Okay, Councilwoman. So that goes into um, 
my next question, it was regarding data. Um, so we have a current system, um, even with licensed professionals, where people can't even use the information. And this is the whole thing, and specifically frontline system does not talk to the Mur Murtis Taylor system. And again, based on how, from what I'm understanding, when the current program that is going to end sometime in the beginning of the year, and when people become technically city of Cleveland, um, social workers, they won't have access to the frontline data or the Murtis Taylor data, which means all the investment that we put in will be at loss because we have not come up with the data sharing agreements or whatever to be able to get a uh, recollection. And this came from, because I actually talked to a team of CIT people, um, and they said, no, you can't get the information from Murtis Taylor. No, you can't get the information from frontline. And this is based on whatever HIPAA, HIPAA laws, but again, my question is how do we have people that are working through coming up with um, the contracts and things of that nature Absolutely. to get the necessary data sharing so that we do not lose the investment um, for the prior years based on when this transition comes from these licensed um, practitioners? To, to Does chair. anybody understand? I mean, A, do you, A, is it correct that that is the current assessment that has been shared with some of us? And two, what is the, is there even a plan to resolve the potential loss of data and information that's been collected over the year? To, to the chair, to the councilwoman, I'll, I'll try to answer, uh, at least to my knowledge, at least uh, my wheelhouse uh, relative to the data that's being collected. The data that's being collected, uh, it's being collected by our officers, uh, our frontline officers and our co-responders and so forth through our Brazos form, which was mentioned before, and it enter, enters into um, the system. So that information and the information I was shared earlier is housed with the Cleveland Division of Police. So we have that, that uh, data that you're talking about. So we have the data available for folks to mine it um, uh, to make whatever assessment they need to. So we have that. Division of Police has that data because our people, our officers, they're the ones collecting that data, that data if that helps. Councilwoman? So just a follow-up again. The social worker said that she didn't have the information from the other organizations. And the officer was on there too. So again, A, I think somebody really needs to look into this issue because again, I think I'm hearing different information and in talking with the CIT team. And because of the organizations, frontline system is different from Murder's Taylor system. Is that correct or yay or nay? Does anybody know? People don't know. Ms. Ballard. Um, thank you for that question. Um, the frontline system and Murtis Taylor have a relationship with each other to share some data. So when they, if they need to look into mobile crisis team data to see whether or not John Smith has ever come across them, they're able to say that because that was a crisis related situation. So even today, if, they, if this was not the co-responder team and, and a worker called to find out whether or not this person was assigned to an agency, Frontline is able to give that because that person is in the current state of a crisis. Um, and so that there is a mechanism in place where they are able to share at least that provisional data and it is not lost. I, okay. I'm, Literally, that is not what the social worker from the crisis intervention team said. Okay. So I, I think, and this is the issue, is that there's a lot of information. I mean, data information and sharing of information, I think, is a real issue. And maybe that's something that the senior strategist person um, can go into. Um, the last, well, it's not the last point, but in looking at the funding, um, one of the things where we have an allocation of $100 um, a year for office supplies and business cards, um, I do not think that is sufficient at all. Um, I would just say, for example, instance, me just meeting an unhoused person, and I realized they, they probably just needed a bus pass, but I didn't have a bus pass, which I'm thinking about how do I get, but I just ended up giving them $10. But my point is, again, when you are in a place of answering a crisis, you need to have care kits and all these type of things, and we don't have any resources, or where, what is the, what is the mindset of actually having these um, kind of supplies available to people outside of this program. What is the philosophy that currently happens in the co-responder model? How are 
supplies and things um, invested, who or can, have they been allocated? Who for can it? respond to that? To the chair, I'll, I'll try to answer that relative to a co-responders model. Obviously, the officers, uh, we give them cards and so forth, and um, cards for themselves to hand out, and also cards that provide resources for individuals. Um, I think having the ability to, first of all, find out what individuals may need, and to your point, to put together a care package, if uh, for well, lack of a better term, care package is something we can look at. I'm not quite sure if we do that now to that extent. Uh, I don't think we do that, at least through our co-responders program as it currently sits right now. But I have to follow up and, and, and make sure I'm speaking ac adequately, or accurately rather, uh, because they may have something. Uh, as we stand right now, I don't believe we have a, a care package, so, so to speak. Yeah, so I think that's something that absolutely needs to be looked at. And then there was just um, a lot of different conversation um, about just this is a program, and I think this is just in the mindset. Um, I do not see this just as a program. I think this should be just how we do business at the city of Cleveland. I do not think this should be something that we are looking for grants and things of that nature. This should be a part and should be funded from our budget because we are looking to elevate and transform the way that we are serving our people based on who they are and what their needs are. Um, but that's a funding thing that hopefully this council will actually begin to look at. Um, and then, you know, just general terms of like what is legal. Um, things are only legal because a group of people said it was. And I, I really think for lawmakers in particularly, we should really think in the context of if you are trying to transform a system where people have been systematically and intentionally disinvested and left out, how do you create the laws and rules that can help support them, not just in isolation, but broader base. Someone talked about, again, us being all, um, I think we all are public service and having the training requirements um, for crisis intervention and amongst other things, that's something should be a standard just for the city of Cleveland in general. But um, I'll just leave this here and then I'll get, whenever we go into an amendments, I'll go into that. So thank you. Time, council lady. We can push you back on. Okay. Um, I have Councilwoman Gray. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I uh, just have a few questions. Um, this is all kind of new to me, so I got a little confused along the way with everyone's feedback, to be honest. So I hope I, uh, I hope I'm on the same page. I just wanted to um, say, um, want a nice meeting you, Carol Baller, uh, first time. I uh, think you are extraordinary, you know, with your background and the information you just provided. So that's all new to me too as well. But I just have a question um, concerning uh, this, uh, how will the ARPA dollars expand and approve these services on the first uh, Commander Drummer? I mean, Commander, right? Wayne is fine. Okay. Sorry. On the first, on the first point, said the program is currently set up for one co-responder team, one officer, and one licensed clinical in each of the five police districts. And since um, Councilwoman Mahler um, just presented that amendment for the uh, care response team of, um, of Director um, Woodson team, would, would a, would, you know, would one of her you know, would one of her employees be added to, be added to the cold responder team at each location per se, if not since a mother had, uh, you know, um, presented the new amendment? No, Councilwoman, through, uh, through the chair, that, that would be a separate, it wouldn't be attached to police. That would be in a, in a, in a completely, completely different department. Um, and they would deploy or and operate as Director Woodson would, would, would say, but it would not be um, in conjunction with the co-response police pro program. Okay. All right. Uh, and, uh, and the only reason why I ask that question is because I uh, called on the community relations team quite often in my community, and they always, and they always are there to assist. So uh, that's why I got a little confused on uh, us presenting the amendment 
and then the work that they do that I call on more them, you know, to come to assist, you know, as your um, as your co-responder team. So. Well, the, 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 the and the offer money is referring to assist the community relations department now, correct? It's for, it's for crisis intervention, so both the, the, the co-responder and for the care model. Development, development implementation of a care model, yes. Correct. Okay, all right. Okay, second question, and since, uh, and since the care response team is added to the amendment, most of those uh, situations are domestic not more so mental. So uh, I'm just, just, I'm just trying to understand and learn, um, you know, the balance between the two. Since that's more domestic, you know, if that's correct, more so than mental, no. how does that um, to the, to the connect? Chair. To the chair, to, to the councilwoman, if it's a domestic related uh, situation, it will not be uh, co-responders uh, responding, nor the uh, care response would be a uniform uh, car that we responded to that situation because the potential for violence is yeah. involved. A point of clarification, you, you referring to domestic- the chair, in, To the chair, to the chair. To the chair, to, to the chair I'm sorry. Councilwoman through the chair, matters of domestic violence, is that what you're referring to? Yes. So yes, yeah, so domestic violence, chief is correct, that would be the pol uh, police. Uh, responding to matters of domestic violence. But for someone who is maybe experiencing a, a mental health crisis okay. that does not carry that violence, it may mm -hmm. be appropriate based on those facts mm -hmm. for the care model. One of the things that, that, we, that we often hear is um, family members saying that the person experiencing the crisis is off their medication, right? Oh. So one of the things that what we would like to spark is when Members know, when families know that members who are in need of medication have stopped taking their medication and they're acting in a particular way that may elevate, that they get us involved sooner. Mm -hmm. And when I say get us involved sooner, send out the care response folks if warranted. Send out the co-response folks if warranted, but we need to get involved sooner mm -hmm. as opposed to after a tragedy, family saying that you know, the, the, the member was off their med medications. Okay, all right. So, okay, I'm just trying to. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to understand the difference. That's all. Because I'm just going to say this: by me working with uh, community relations uh, in certain situations that I have called on in my community, uh, two of her uh, employees have uh, came into my community and worked with different situations, as in our chair, um, uh, as our chair. Um, a chairperson, uh, Mike Belisky, has said that sometimes you have neighbors going at each other. That's a domestic neighborly, you know, dispute. And I've called on community relations, and, uh, you know, to come to handle those different disputes in my community. And I have also called on one of her employees that dealt with drug trafficking incidents. So dealing with the care response, and that's what they do, and it's separate from the cold response of the police, per se. You know, what's determined between a, a which department that needs to be called on, you know, in those incidents, you know, pertaining to the uh, separate uh, alternative, uh, you know, phone numbers, nine, uh, you know, 988 and, you know, and or 911, so. Anyone want, want to respond at all? Well, uh, to the chair there, Councilwoman, uh, currently we don't have a 988 uh, response. That's something that we're looking at. We're looking at also with the stream senior strategist through the health department uh, to have the ability to kind of evaluate what's mm -hmm. best uh, for the, the uh, city of Cleveland relative to our correspondence, which we have, we will maintain, and also to evaluate a co-responder, uh, I'm sorry, a care response and right now, the care response, as we're looking at it uh, today, uh, it would be through the Department of Public, uh, I'm sorry, Department of Community Relations, uh, uh, Director Woodson and her, her people and so forth. And I think it kind of goes to the uh, director's point 
Um, hopefully we will get the general public, if their, their fa loved ones or family members or family members uh, in a crisis, like for something uh, like uh, they are off their medication, that they will uh, reach out well in advance if they go into a critical state. And in that particular instance, you're reaching out to community relations and their, co their um, care response individuals to, to go there and to help the, the, the family and that individual versus having law enforcement respond out there, even in a care, in a co-responders uh, uh, platform. Okay, Councilwoman. All right, thank you. That's thank you, and, okay, thank you very much. For keeping your time is all. Sure. all yeah, yes. Sure. There was a question. Point. point. Ms. House, your point. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, the one thing I saw was the the vehicles. Um, this was in the second whereas clause, and I would. Can you talk about in? Are there in what type of vehicles are currently used in this co-response model? To, uh, to the uh, chair, the councilwoman. Currently, we have unmarked. Uh, police cars, um, uh, sometimes having a marked unit as well as uh, uniform officers kind of can, can spark and trigger uh, for in the, the individuals they're dealing with. So currently they're unmarked cars. Okay, thank you. Okay, and just a follow up, is that, um, are they all like, like the typical sedan? Is it a minivan? Good. It, like Chief. To the chair of the councilman, that's a very good, good question. I know in certain uh, agencies and cities they use vans and so forth, and that's something that we will evaluate here. It doesn't necessarily have to be an unmarked police car, the traditional unmarked police cars, although now most of our cars are the Ford Explorer type, uh, Ford Explorer type of vehicles. We have other vehicles that we can use, and a van I think is also something that we can take a look at. Thank you. Um, we have back, back on the list, we have Ms. Maurer and Ms. House. Great, thank you. Um, I want to uh, dive in a, a little bit on the um, social work questions. I know we've had a long morning, um, and so I will try to be brief with these remarks. Um, I, I want to understand a little bit more about the, social, the, the 10 licensed social workers, social workers, or other professionals um, that we might be employing in furtherance of this ordinance. I want to make sure I understand, I, after I spoke, I realized I might not have misunderstood something. Um, is the goal for those to be hired directly by the city of Cleveland through the chair to the panel? Directors? Uh, councilman for the chair, that is the goal. Okay, great. I, I noticed in the um, summary that um, the current social workers who were um, utilized through Murtis Taylor and Frontline had expressed a desire to be hired by the city of Cleveland. So is the goal to bring those people in first through the city and then 10 additional or the current set who might move over to Cleveland and then? Director. Uh, Councilman, that, that would be part of the assessment in a conversation with finance. Okay, great. Um, I, I think that will be important because that will help us consider how much capacity we're actually expanding um, with this. Um, though I suppose I'm just working out the math, but I, I guess the idea is that the current contract for those social workers is ending in 2023, so we have to find a way to pay regardless. Is, is that correct through the chair right. to the panel? Councilman through the chair, that's correct. Okay, great. Um, so, um, and, and, and I only know this because of my mentee who I'm so proud of, who um, just graduated with her degree in social work from um, Ohio State, from the Ohio State University. Um, but uh, I, my understanding is that both social workers and licensed clinical social workers require some degree of supervision. Um, do we have capacity within the city to have the correct supervision for those um, social workers through the chair? Health director. Uh, Th th through the chair to the council person, yeah, that's that's a great question, and I think we'll have to work that out with Frontline Mers Taylor and our own internal resources within um, uh, Prevention Intervention Youth Opportunity Group. Okay, yeah. got it. So that sounds like that might be one of those questions for that senior strategist to figure out how we how we bring those people in. Um, and I want to return to the question um, from uh, from my from my colleague, Councilwoman House, about the data. Um, because in the summary, it was noted that there is a RFP, the, the Social Support Services Unit has issued an RFP for software solution for record keeping and documentation that is HIPAA compliant. Um, so first of all, who is, I, we've talked for this whole day and somehow I don't know who the Social, social Support Services Unit, I haven't seen that term before. So can you clarify for me who that is? Who, through can, the chair? who can respond to that question? Um, that's our 
that is our uh, contract with Case Western Reserve. Um, when the city got its BJA grant for the co-responder team, they contracted with the <coughs> Adams Board. And the Adams Board um, hired, um, uh, contracted with Murtis Taylor and Frontline Services for those social workers. Um, and then as part of that grant, the city contracts with Case Western Reserve for that data component. So that's what you're seeing now. What I hear you saying is that when this passes, <coughs> that um, that portion of the APRA dollars that would have come to the Adams Board to continue the contract with Frontline and Murtis Taylor would go elsewhere, where these workers would be hired by the city. That's what I just heard you say. I think that's what I heard the panel say. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just one point of clarification yeah, to the chair. Clarify that. So the social support services unit is is uh, Chief Sonia Pryor Jones Department is is where that that unit lives. So across many city departments is, is the work we're doing here. Okay. Got it. Um, and um, only because I'm I'm digging into these RFPs. I actually there's a cent, there's a fi there's a finance page that has the RFPs from the city, but I didn't see this RFP on there. Um, and I, I was wondering if we could be supplied that RFP. It looks, sounds like it has already been issued through the chair to the panel. Who, who would have the ability to provide that to us? I um, believe that may be Chief, um, Chief Pryor Jones. Okay, Possibly. great. I, um, okay, maybe we'll, our... We'll make that request, make that request through both directors okay. here. Um, all right, and... Um, I want to make sure that I understand what that RFP is for, for record keeping and documentation that's HIPAA compliant. Is that getting to the data sharing issue between Frontline and Murtis Taylor and now potentially the city that the Councilwoman House was discussing through the chair to the panel? Uh, Ms. Ballard, could you comment on that or who can? I, I don't think that it would because if, from what I'm hearing you say now, these, the, the staff would be going over to the city, correct? Well, that, that's for the administration to acknowledge. That's for the administration. So um, I think an MOU between the two agencies regarding uh, communication is what works. We've had MOUs um, from our crisis agency to all of our agencies throughout the system to talk among them when there is a crisis-related situation. So when they call mobile crisis team, that MOU and that uh, continuity of care agreement is what happens within the mental health system. Uh, okay, great. I have so much to learn in this space, so I really appreciate you you explaining that. Um, so, I, just to put a pin, put a put a put a point in this, the RFP for a software solution for record keeping and documentation that is HIPAA compliant, that will allow social workers housed within the city of Cleveland to adequately. Um, and actually, I don't know how to end that sentence, and that's why I need to ask the question. So could we finish that sentence? The chair to the director, communicate with each other about their patients. Okay. Clients. And, Clients. and communicate with each other and Frontline and, and Murtis Taylor? To the chair to the council member, absolutely. Okay. All right. That, that's very helpful. Um, I, that, those are all my questions. Thank you for your patience and for my, my questions Thank today. Thank you. Councilwoman House. Um, so I know in this conversation we talk about mental health episodes, um, and the one thing I want to know is how uh, do we send uh, co-responder units out for those who may be uh, dealing with uh, dementia or any forms of Alzheimer's? To the chair, Councilwoman. Um, yeah, potentially, uh, depending on what the uh, f uh, first responders come across. Um, they may not have the capabilities to, to deal with that, so they'll call our, our uh, co-responders respond to it. So there's a possibility that they are responding to those type of uh, calls as well. It would be interesting to, I, I mean, again, I, I don't know what it is and I ask, but in listening to the conversations, it's always from something like, um, you know, someone that might be homeless or whatever, and even in, like, my office, I know there is a, um, a, a contingent of people who are calling me that I um, believe there is uh, some type of um, memory health uh, disease that they may be dealing with. Um, and having that type of information provided when we collect our data to just understand how our teams are prepared to address those issues, I think will be helpful. Um, I am going to reiterate, 
this thing around the data is literally somebody watching on YouTube from cases like, no, they're going to lose the information when the individuals come to the city of Cleveland. I know I've talked to, and, and, and again, I do not, I, we really have to get this, like, somebody somewhere and I don't know who the authority person is yeah. because you all are saying something that I someone is telling me is different and we just need to have some clarity on that um, and I think it's really important because if we have invested money there is no we have to prevent the opportunity of losing this case information that can carry um, and be useful yeah I, th to the chair to the council member and, and the viewer on YouTube um, it, so they're referring to the confidential client information. So, I, oh yes, okay. So I, I do think, yeah, with an MOU and a, a signed, you know, a, a agreement that we could resolve that issue, um, and that would be part of the role of the strategist because that is the challenge for us now. You know, me coming out of healthcare when I'm taking care of a patient at Metro Health versus University Hospital versus Cleveland Clinic versus St. Vincent versus Frontline. I mean, that information does not communicate with each other uh, easily. So that's something that we all have to solve, absolutely. OK, we have um, three citizens here, my colleagues who are wishing, uh, who've asked to testify, comment on the legislation that is before us. I'm going to take them in the order in which they signed up. Mm -hmm. uh, they are given each three minutes under the rules. Uh, first one is Mr. Van Leer from West 45th Street. Mr. Van Leer, would you care to come to the table? <coughs> please have a microphone set aside for him. Okay, thank you. Good, good afternoon. Chair Polensic, Chair Conwell, and, and members yes. of the committees and the other people present. My name is Pete Van Leer. I'm a senior researcher at Policy Matters Ohio, where I focus on ways to make the criminal legal system more equitable and humane. So thanks for the opportunity to comment on this proposal, um, on the co-responder program and the senior strategist, which, you know, it really is about better supporting people who are experiencing crisis related to mental health. You know, you've talked about this, mental behavioral health, housing insecurity, and a lot of other issues, right? So. Um, a lot of information was shared already today that sort of shifts my, my commentary, but I'm going to stick mostly to what I was planning to talk about. It's, I think it's important to continue expanding how we provide crisis care, so I'm very encouraged um, that we're not only talking about co-response today, but also care response, non-police care response, and new ways to consider, you know, helping Clevelanders who, who need help, right? Um, so one thing I want to highlight is I recently con helped convene a conversation among, gr among a group of service providers who are focused on behavioral health and crisis care, including Dr. Michael Biscaro, the Vice President of Behavioral Health Services at Sisters of Charity Health System, um, Habiba Grimes, the President and CEO of, of the Positive Education mm -hmm. Program, Dr. Megan Testa, psychiatrist at UH and medical director of the Diversion Center, and Jane Granzier, who's Associate Director of Crisis Services at Frontline Service. So we came together to talk about care response, essentially, uh, the main thing. And that's, as you've all talked about, it sends teams of people, uh, including EMTs, mental health workers, or trained peers with lived experience, instead of police on certain kinds of emergency calls. So they can better provide the assistance most needed by people in crisis. So as we've already discussed, this is being piloted or has already been successfully implemented in cities around the country, including Cincinnati, Baltimore, New Orleans, and many others. One piece that you've discussed, and I'm very encouraged by the direction that it's taken because we were not aware of this when I wrote this yesterday, um, you know, talking about this senior level strategist. And we think that, you know, that group talked a lot about why that position should be with the health department. So I'm very encouraged that it sounds like that's where this is headed. Um, but those folks, in, you know, uh, said I could talk about what we discussed. And so they agreed that that person should have uh, really solid experience as a clinician in behavioral health and should be reporting to the health director. And it matters because while the proposed ordinance, uh, ordinance is about uh, addressing important public safety issues, it's also critical to public health and addressing unmet community needs. So it's really that position in the health department will, will enable that person to have that broader view. Um, in our conversation, we also talked about other skills and experience that that person should have. And not only that person, but others focused on this work. And that includes the ability to leverage resources, collaboration, and buy-in 
across diverse partners and systems, including you know, other agencies, organizations, the city, the county. Um, a lot of outreach experience and strong familiar, familiarity with on the street work. Deep roots in the community, so we're not sort of like some, not some, somebody who doesn't really have a good sense of what's happening in the community, and we've been hearing from um, various council members about that today. The ability to really manage this project. Um, if I can just finish up real quick, you know, we talked about the need to focus on equity and understanding that anyone, we have to have good goals, like how do you measure success? And we've already talked about some of the data, but really thinking deeply about how do you measure success of these kinds of programs. Um, so, you know, I just want to say that um, thanks again for stepping up to add resources and investment to this kind of work. Um, it's really important. And please feel free to reach out with any questions you may have. I can leave a copy of my, my comment here. Um, there's a broad coalition that's working, and we would be very much interested in presenting to this body or other bodies. Or There's just a big coalition of people, service providers, advocates from the community who really want to see this happen. So we'd love to reach out. Thank you for your comments. Our next um, speaker um, will be Larry Heller. He's 55th Street. Please take a seat. I'm just going to give my phone number. Is it different from this one? Yeah, like the perfect Just record. pull the mic up and speak right into it. Hi, my name is Larry Heller. I'm with the Ohio Recovery Association. Nora, I'd like to thank all of you for considering this issue. And I'd like to urge you and respectfully request that you, that you support this co-responder model. Uh, I believe it's an important first step toward a health first or care response model. As some of you have mentioned, it's, that, that's what we need. I am a behavioral health professional. I do work in the field. I have a great deal of experience. I encounter a lot of people with mental health issues. Uh, I do spend a lot of time interacting with people with mental health issues, including a lot of people who are either in crisis or who have recently experienced crisis. And many of them have met with our first responders, including our co-responder models and our CIT teams. Uh, I do spend a lot of time on the streets, both per personally and professionally. Uh, in addition to my work as an outreach worker in the behavioral health field, uh, I also spend a lot of weekends and spare time out on the streets giving out food and talking to people, listening to people who share their responses, who share their perceptions. So word on the street is that almost everybody has good things to say, whether they have personally had experience or whether they know someone who has. Perceptions are very gradually changing in our community. And many people who may have previously been reluctant to seek help or make a call may be more likely to do so in the future if we expand this program because we are helping reach people and change perceptions. People who may have had a bad experience or heard of bad experiences and be afraid to call for first responders because they're afraid of the response they'll get may become more likely as we expand toward the, uh, through the co-responder and toward care first or health first response. Okay. Now, I have significant anecdotal evidence. I've heard from a number of people. So I, I respectfully request we support this proposal, uh, including the uh, amendment about the care response. And I further urge and respectfully request that we, uh, as some couple of people have stated, keep this under health rather than under public safety. Mental health care is health care, period. Mental health care is one of the essential elements of health care, according to our Affordable Care Act. It's an essential element. It is part of health care. Mental health care is health care. Please keep it in health. And please uh, consider this, consider uh, supporting the co-responder model as a part of a long-term goal toward a health first or care response model. Thank you. Thank you. Last uh, speaker is uh, Rosie Alfie. Um, 
does not indicate an address here, but it indicates uh, here to talk about toll responders. Do I have to? Okay. My name's Rosie Palfi. Um, I'm, ac I'm actually a resident of Parma. I'm here because I am a member of the um, City of Cleveland Mental Health Response Advisory Committee, um, which was a mandate to be created um, under the settlement agreement with the Department of Justice. And I just want to point out that literally like five minutes ago, there's breaking news that the Cleveland Police Reform Monitor is stepping down. Um, Channel 3. The, who, the, the who's stepping down? The, the Cleveland Police Monitor. And there's going to be a, a hearing, I guess, soon about it. But any, anyway, so um, the, reason, the reason why I'm here is crisis intervention is a component of the consent decree. And Every time we hear the city talk about the success of the consent decree reforms, they always go to crisis intervention as being at the top of the list, okay? So here's the problem is, um, number one, I want to thank all of you for the time and care and attention that you've taken to this, with this, and especially the, the Health and Human Services Committee members and um, for, for realizing that this is, this is health and that this should be a joint um, adventure. So here's the problem, is the Mental Health Response Advisory Committee has completely been cut out of this. And so the city needs to figure out um, where crisis intervention fits in with police reform. Because if it doesn't fit with us, then it fits with the new, um, the police commission. Our members wanted to make a recommendation at our September meeting for a care response model. And the Adams board who is running our committee under a memorandum of understanding with the city refused to allow us to do that. Um, they, they said we were out of time. Um, and and the, the meeting was, was running, you know, we were almost at the end of the meeting. But the bottom line is, this memorandum of understanding has been a roadblock to reform. And uh, we were told, hey, our next meeting's in November, we can make recommendations. I said, listen, this, they may have this money spent and allocated by the end of September. So last summer, CDP, last April, we had a retreat. CDP said they wanted to explore a care response model. We had an entire year to look at this, okay? And nothing happened. And then in January, the city, the city had an opportunity to apply for a free learning opportunity with the federal government for to learn about co-response and care response models, they passed it up. Uh, it would have this notification would have gone to your grants department, and um, we at our MRAC meeting in January, uh, we were told by the Adams board that there was quote no money in it, and the former crisis intervention team coordinator who, who left in March said that the city was in flux with the new administration. And so that, you know, this was something that they couldn't explore at the, this time. So I, I, um, I feel like a strategic plan should be done first before an, a comprehensive needs assessment. Um, just find out what, what, this, what um, residents want and need, because that hasn't been done. Uh, we haven't done a survey since 2016, uh, and we're trying to engage the, uh, the community, and basically, we've pretty much been handcuffed from doing our job. So uh, I appreciate what you all are doing, but I, I just don't think that it's ready. So thank you. Thank you. Um, to the two, the three directors that are here, um, and to the chief and to Adams Board, um, you just heard, you've heard three public testimonies. Um, would you care to comment at all, Director? Sure. Um, so. Uh, to, to the chair, to the committee, to, to the audience. Um, really appreciate the comments from the group and uh, been in touch with uh, some of those groups to learn more about best practices. I've spoken to the group in Cincinnati, Columbus, and Pittsburgh who's doing this work. And so really 
um, proud of the work we've done and, and hopefully um, what we're about to do. Okay. Director? You know, um, Chair, uh, Council the Chair, uh, this is a significant step forward. Um, you know, we, we, Pull your mic forward so we can. We know that there were a lot of unanswered questions, um, and that's for our strategists to really work out this program. It would be disingenuous to come here to say that we've ironed out yeah. what a care response program looks like and, and how it works in conjunction with the co-response program. We're going to hire someone who's going to come in and, and really like study this um, and figure out what's best for the city and how we can execute that. I share Dr. Mongolis' um, excitement in, in, in these, uh, these programs. Um, it's, 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 it is a step towards the 21st century policing, 21st century public safety. Uh, Director Woodson. Thank you to the chair and to the council people. Thanks for just hearing us yeah. today on this amendment um, and amendments and as well as the actual legislation. Um, it is a step forward. Um, it is a step that will try something new, and I know we talk often about doing something different, being innovative. Um, this will at least show us how does innovation work by this care model, which will be uh, added into if passed today. Um, so I'm always, it's a pleasure to work with the safety department and health um, as we work collectively um, and try to work through some of the questions and concerns. I don't want anyone to think that we didn't jot down your concerns to try to explore further okay. to try to have more definitive answers. Thank you. Chief. Chair and to the council members, again, thank you for this robust conversation. Um, I think it's important uh, to note that we're all, I believe, on this, uh, working towards the same goal, which is to provide the best uh, possible care for our citizens here in the city of Cleveland. But I, I just don't want to lose um, that uh, the division and, and the co-responders and, and now working towards potentially a care response, that uh, we are, uh, again, a, a different division relative to our response to folks that are in crises. It's just totally different. Um, and I, again, I just don't want that, that lost. Um, and that we're sitting at the table here again trying to be innovative, as our Director Woodson just said, in our response to make sure, again, that we are taking care of our people, and again, especially our folks, our citizens who are in crisis, that we get wraparound services to them um, and provide services that they desperately need. And that's not always necessarily okay. um, someone uh, in a uniform, a, a patrol officer, taking care of that. But we've come a long way, and we've improved dramatically and drastically in our response to folks that are in crisis. Again, I just don't want that lost. Ms. Ballard? Um, I want to thank you for inviting me for this conversation. I think it was, it, it's very helpful to hear um, oh, how the milieu um, is expanding, changing, and evolving when it comes to crisis care. Because it's not all about public health, public health, public safety, it's about the community at large. And so this helps us into next steps. I know we were here not too long ago talking about the role of St. V's and ERs and all of these conversations. And I remember some of the comments uh, uh, that were made then. So all of these conversations are related uh, in terms of the milieu within not only the city of Cleveland, but Cuyahoga County in general. Okay. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, may I just say one more yes. thing? Yes. Just um, I want to stress, and, and I, I, we needed to say it, this is very important to the mayor. Chief and I have to have meet with the mayor once a week, and this is in our discussion. I want to thank Frontline Services, Murders Taylor, uh, and, um, and the Adams Board for, for this. This is a, We're excited again. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, Chairman Conwell. Thank you very, thank you very, very much. Um, I just, someone just texted me some great things about you, Mrs. Um, Ballard. And I was like, I don't know her. And uh, some people from Murders Taylor. Oh. And uh, they were watching, and, and uh, they said some great things. And um, let me tell you this. I'm big on evaluations with me. I'm big on council having oversight. Council Chair Mike Plinsick and I, we both agree with that, with oversight. You got to evaluate this for me. And here's the other thing. We might push this legislation through, but the thing about policy is, is it can take a shift on you. 
and we'll push this mental health piece. But so if we don't evaluate it, whatever we're doing right now, it can shift on us the next day or the next week or the next month. So the thing, I always say this about policy, you must manage it, you must manage it. And here's the other thing about the grants. Your department, majority of your department, uh, uh, Director uh, uh, Margo, is, is by grants. If you gotta have a good evaluation process, we're not saying if we don't receive grants, we're not gonna move forward with this, but this ARPA is a grant from the federal government. So grants is very, very important. You know, our budget is, is similar to a 501c3 budget. It's gains and losses, fines, fees, um, taxes. It's almost the same way. You got to bring in grant dollars, right? I mean, right now, because we know that in the long run, it's five million dollars. Um, so if we bring in some more money for next week, as a matter of fact, and it, with the health department, they're always bringing us grants. You guys write proposals. We give you the authority to accept the grants. So that means a lot to us here bringing that, so that's why I'm in on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we, have, uh, we have the original amendments that came before us that were submitted, which were read into the record. Then we have a second set. Ms. House, you indicated you had uh, m amendments as well. Okay. Okay, so do we have those amendments? No. Well, no, I, I mean, again, my, my thing was just it, it needed to be in Department of Public Health, and I, I'm going so, to stick to that. I and I, so, wait a minute. So, you said what? so you indicated earlier you had amendments. Yes. Do you have something to? It was, I mean, again, it's not written down. It was emailed back in September. To who? To the law department and to um, you as a chair. I don't recall that. Did the okay. law department have that, have that email? <laughs> Okay. But again, it in okay. The, what is it? Is it an extensive email? No. Okay. It was what one is sentence. It? Then what is it? Tell us what it is. It, again, well, it's changing. Not the. At the end of the day, I just, um, I, I'm gonna just get clarification. So the one young lady just come up here and indicated that we, the reason why we even have a co-responder model is based off a consent decree. Is that correct? Yeah or nay? Mm -hmm. Direct chief. To the uh, chair of councilman, that is part of it. Oh, it's, it's part of it. Okay. Um, so in going through all of that, um, it's not like we thought of this on our own. It was kind of compelled and we were forced to do it. Um, and looking at the body of evidence, um, I just really feel that we're talking about health care and that this uh, should be um, viewed through a little bit. I just, it just needs to be. Uh, from the senior strategist on, it should include the department um, or the director of public health. Everything in here it says the department of um, or the director of public safety, and I I just think it needs to be, it needs to be guided uh, by the director of public health because it's a very different um, frame of thinking. So uh, where all the places it's in the first whereas how, how do you want to do this? Because like I said, is do I'm amending the amendment that's in front we, of us? We can we can do. How, we, how do you want? Because again, it's going to change. It depends on what we're we going would to do. I would prefer to have the the amendment in writing. Um, that's and and so we could and so the law director could incorporate it into the amendments that we already have before us. Because I don't want to have I don't want to have competing amendments here. I want to have one clear, concise set of amendments. Director, you have a comment? Just, sure, to the chair, to the council member. So the, the third amendment from Councilwoman Moore it has Director of Public Health over the senior strategist. Does that? Because I was, I was looking wait, wait. forward to your amendment, and uh, I, I believe that it, it inspired. It don't matter. Yeah, I'm going to do what I want to do. It anyway, did, so. I, I still, so. even though Councilwoman Moore wrote it out, it was certainly inspired by, by yeah, our conversation. Whatever y'all want to do, because that's what y'all that's what y'all been doing all the time, so it don't matter. Go ahead, do what y'all gonna do. Uh, let's, let's ask you a question. No. You showed it to me yeah. yesterday, okay. Council Lady. Do you have a copy of what no, you showed me it's yesterday? Okay. I'm, I'm done. okay, it's not good. But you know what? When it goes to finance, then um, law director, can we we should be able to uh, that way, yeah. to focus on the amendment doing finance. 
It's okay. You can bring it up to us. Okay. Okay. Oh, man. Okay, let's, 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 <laughs> okay, okay. Let's, let's, let's move on here. We have the law yeah, director. Yeah, I, I'm, yes, the law director. So, and what we've heard at the table today, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that this is really a partnership between three departments, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And in partnership with the Adams Board. That's going to continue. That's correct. Okay. And, you know, I, I can add a clarification, Chair, that may help. Yes. Is that the reason why you have the co-responder model out of public safety is because yes. the police are responding to incidents that require yes. police response. Right. Out of community community relations, it's out of community relations because it's it doesn't require police response. It requires exactly. for the like, community exactly. relations work. So it's based off of the missions of the department where this where our crisis intervention um, program is divided into. Okay. So you the three of you see and the chief and the board see a working partnership here. And obviously, bringing on this senior strategist will help define those roles of each department, each section here, um, because we're all in this together. I don't want to see, and I want to make it very clear as the chairman of public safety and as the uh, dean of the body, I don't want to see um, an adversarial role between the various departments on this issue. I want to see a partnership between the three. Um, and, and let me just finish it by saying, um, there has been a big change in the way we view things in this city. I can tell you that as the senior member. Um, I think for far too long we looked upon everything as a policing issue. And I think all of us have come to the realization that it's just not policing, it's just not about going out there and sending out policemen to, a, to address an issue. There are, there are real issues, concerns of mental health, uh, uh, substance abuse, and, and as I, I remind myself when I'm sitting here listening, I remember when I first um, came into consult years ago, um, two gentlemen who lived off of Euclid Avenue on a street called Torpidson were, were, they both had issues and they were not getting along and they were fighting over bushes, over hedges. And it got to the point that the one killed the other one yeah, over the bushes. And I'll never forget coming on the scene and standing out in the street and looking at those hedges and saying, is this insane? One man is dead and another one's going to prison, which he did, over bushes because there, we, couldn't, we couldn't have anybody to respond to the conflict between those two neighbors. So things have changed dramatically. I commend the administration. Um, for uh, recognizing this. This has probably been far too long in the, in the making for us to go this direction and bringing on co-responders and all the other healthcare professionals that we need. I'm supportive of it um, because I know things have to change. 2022, we have to do things differently in the streets of Cleveland. And I, I believe we, uh, the administration and uh, the police department has been doing that in partnership with health and now community relations. And again, we're going to bring you to the table. So be prepared to be, make a full scale presentation. Okay. We have, an, we have four amendments in front of us proposed by Ms. Maurer. Is there any objection to these amendments? Would someone make a motion to accept the amendments? Oh, is there? Is I'm there? Sorry, is there? I will make a motion for this. Okay. Well, I propose. Okay. I'm there's sorry. Been a mo I, I will motion. There's been I will a motion, motion for my made own. I'm and a member of the House Committee. Thank you, okay. Chair. I apologize. Okay. Our been a motion made. Listen up. <laughs> Listen up, everyone. 
<laughs> it's been a long day. I know. And it's going to get longer if we don't pay attention. Um, uh, so uh, there's, there's been a motion made. It's been seconded. Is there any, all in favor of the amendments? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, Mr. Law Director, these are to be incorporated with the existing amendments. I don't want to have, I, I, I want to have, uh, we want to have a clean piece when it goes into finance, so there's no confusion, so everybody understands that, okay? Are there any other matters uh, for the good and welfare of the Public Safety Committee or the Depart or the, the, um, or the uh, Committee on Health, Human Services, and the Arts? I appreciate all the, my colleagues that sure. were here. I sure. appreciate Councilman Conwell. Yes, sir? I do like to see um, Councilwoman Stephanie House. Uh, I never received it. She said she sent it to the law department. I mean, okay. my colleague, I want to respect okay. her. Right. And I uh, would love to see it. She was walking around with it yesterday. So uh, I guess we'll. Well, we'll, we'll I will hope to have that in writing. Please describe that. Please stop. Like, that's okay. Okay. No. Okay. 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 Uh, without any objection, uh, the Public Health Committee and the part uh, uh, and department and, and <laughs> Public Safety Committee is adjourned. Thank you.